M with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Very good morning. Happy Tuesday. How are things? It's O2B AM. I'm delighted to uh, have you with us as we do every weekday morning between now and 10 a.m. O2B AM with Jeanette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. A stacked studio once again this morning. We've got Cork, we've got Galway, we've got Sligo. All from the coast, actually. Colin Boohey, good morning. Morning, Shane. Johnny Ward, good morning. Morning, Shane. Cathy McNamee, good morning. Morning. These are all from coastal counties, you just realised. Yeah, just, Feel sad about that, Shane? I am just feel left out. Monaghan's one of those forgotten inland counties. Is it Leash that's the doubly landlocked? The only doubly landlocked county. Doesn't touch a county that even t- that touches the sea. Fun fact, guys, this morning. <laughs> table, if it comes up in a table quiz, just go right down Leash. Pretty sure it's Leash that's the only doubly Definitely landlocked. Definitely Google it before Definitely to Google make sure it first. that. It's giving you correct information. Exactly. Do any of you actually grew up near the sea? I'm from like I'm basically from the Midlands, even though I'm from Galway. Like mm, right. closer to uh, Athlone than Roscommon than uh, than Salt Hill. Short drive. Yeah, yeah. I live right on the beach. Your so s- your screen. Has. Yeah, our house like overlooks the dunes onto the beach. That's so Ocras Head, head is close either. to there. Yeah, exactly. Beach Be- bar. I've never been to the beach bar, but that's on my list for this summer. It's ten out of ten. You can see the Schlieve League cliffs as well across the water, especially like oh. on a clear day. It's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, yeah, you got Nutnare, Ben Bulbin, the whole thing in front of you. Ben Bulbin around the right hand corner. Mm. Right hand corner. It's so. a pretty yeah, it's a pretty sweet place to grow up. I have to say. Ah, do you class. ever get bored of the sea? Never. Yeah. No. Like my favorite thing to do whenever. I'm home is hop on my bike cycle down so you can't actually walk to the beach across the back of the dunes from our house because there's like a river in between that you can't get through because there's just like loads of gorse and stuff um, so I'd cycle around it's like a mile and hop in the sea quick swim walk the beach cycle home happy days Sounds lovely I would love to live by the sea that's my um, changes your mindset doesn't it it does it's just access to to water as well you can just get your have a dip in at any given moment um, an endless possibility oh, it doesn't matter like what sort of mood you're in even if it's a terrible mm. day and you can't get in for a swim say the water's too choppy or whatever you just go down sit in the car watch the waves for a bit, for a bit of a while well, sea swim's a big thing before Covid yeah? it, not, uh, not really it, it was a Covid uh, thing like it, it really was like it would have been in coastal areas like my mum mm. is part of like a swim tribe and has been for like years and it's just like a group of women like, some some mornings it could be 20 of them some mornings it could be two and they all just meet at a certain time every single morning and go for a swim and have done for like and the it last was amazing because <coughs> like it became this thing in Ireland that I, I'd say Ireland was one of the few countries in the world where people would even countenance in any sort of big numbers getting in swim in say like February Yeah, where it is cold but it, it's manageable and the colder it is the better you feel after it I think True. if you can get over the shiver it's amazingly good for your health mental health we don't eat uh, fish enough no not at all in country no it's um, scandalously water boring. kind of adds a bit of pizzazz to your thinking when you're walking do you know it makes you feel if you have an important life decision to make go out for a walk I think it's vital that water Sound is there. The water. Yeah, you kind of look on into the distance oh, yeah. and make your big decision. Get philosophical, like. A bit of Hollywood to it, you know. Well, it's the timelessness of it as well, that yeah. that water has been coming in and out of that shore just for, like, well, long, long, long yeah. before you were there. Yeah. 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 You'd almost yeah. call it relentless. Now, speaking of um, uh, pizzazz, succession, Oh, Ali. sorry, we have to warn people about this. Yeah. I watched this watched it last night. The finale. Can't the finale. And I just want to warn everyone that we are going to go ahead with the succession finale recap tomorrow live so on the, the show half the office hasn't actually seen it yet correct we're given I think with was fair warning three days out from when it's live on TV <coughs> and so we're going to do it on tomorrow morning's show we're going to talk about succession finale we'll out. give you loads of warning to I walk away I watched episode four of the last season last night so I have six episodes to go so you're out I'm, I'm going to have to step aside tomorrow I'm similar yeah, yeah. yeah. You're a little behind yeah. I have a very special guest from the OTB Annals of History, the great Sue Murphy will be in studio. I thought you were going to say Brian Logan, Cox Logan. Yeah, the way yeah. you built that up. From there, yeah. You really set that one up. Yeah. Well, Brian, Co- Brian Cox said you had to be them. there. Kieran Culkin live Good. in studio. No. In the words of Logan Roy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> F off. What's his, what's his best quote? Yeah. There's a few good local. So that's a fair warning to people. Yeah. Um, it'll be on tomorrow's show and they're in the middle of the show. We've had a on your defeat tomorrow. Saturday, though, Shane. That was. Yeah, it was tough. I, I forgot to ask you because we were in what Friday and it came into my mind last night. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. Uh, anytime you lose a final is mm. difficult. Um, I would have put myself in the red in the performance rankings, but there wasn't enough room. Right. So 
thankfully there wasn't enough room just an off day just an off day for us yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you have those I suppose yeah. we've a good mix of youth and experience we'll be back next year also commiserations to my housemate who's a big Boston Celtics fan very very tough night for them last night they came back from 3-0 down against the Heat Miami Heat only to lose 4-3 in game 7 last night so it's the Miami Heat that progressed to play the Denver Nuggets in the NBA playoff finals so that's going to be fascinating we'll probably touch on that until later in the week or early next week certainly we'll do something on that we'll do something on that for yeah. sure because uh, I know a lot of Irish people are interested despite it being in the middle of the night a lot <laughs> it's tough to watch it you see I'd love to watch it only for the obviously our, our hours don't do you think but the last was, dance has played a big uh, part oh, in that oh yeah I always feel there was actually a very sizable minority huge interest in basketball in yeah. Ireland yeah yeah for sure I think it just needs more as Kieran Donnelly said to us recently it needs more bums on seats at Irish basketball matches to you would think uh, basketball would be huge in this country considering the weather yeah, yeah. they're going to be affected like it should be big yeah. in the likes of Castle Island and parts of Kerry is it becoming more watchable than Gaelic football is a question because I think Morris Brosnan's article in the Examiner today um, speaks about just the Roscommon common possession game Martin Brownie actually touched on a very similar um, pretty much the same thing when Roscommon beat Mayo in the Connacht Championship that um, Davy Burke has a possession style um, I do wonder now I, I, I've been watching some Gaelic football and Joe Brawley and Mick Foley have spoken about recent games in Ulster that are basically really boring into the last 10 minutes. But is it time to think about like um, um, a stop clock, basically, that you can only have possession for so long? Sure, um, not like basketball, yeah. Yeah, like it's just something. I think Gaelic football has, has you know, the, the mark and stuff. It has brought in changes in recent years to try and, you know, promote kick passing and all that. But um, it's... It's 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 becoming a bit like a bad soccer game at times where people just are so are just they they just develop into conversations among the crowd because it's not they know nothing's really happening. Um, it's it's an interesting one. I know a lot of people are really struggling to watch Gaelic football right now. This is nothing new, obviously, yeah. but it's not getting better. You, you, it's interesting. You thought Monaghan Derry was was all right. I, I only saw the report. Now Mick Foley said it was an awful game of football. See, I, as you said, as we said before the show, you probably are a bit coloured when your county is involved, mm. and it's an exciting game. Exciting as in a point or two in it and it could mm. go either way at the end um, yeah maybe on quality it wasn't fantastic and then it Mon and get a black card in the second half and the usual thing happens where the team with black card tries to slow things down a bit and get their injuries or whatever mm. not saying the modern players weren't injured but that happens mm. and that's a tactic that you have to use uh, because if the clock doesn't stop when you're down for an injury why wouldn't you do that you know mm. uh, do you think that it is um at an all-time low in terms of uh, a watching fest at the moment, getting football. Uh, no, but you see, the funny thing is, if you watch, say, like the, there was a great documentary. I don't know if you saw it last night. You saw on, um, Kevin Moore and on RT. Yeah, Ke- Kevin Brannigan. It's hard it. just yet. Yeah. It's well worth watching. But like you, you compare football then to now, like it's a completely different game but like it's it's actually a better game now it's just a lot more tactical mm. do you know what I mean I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed the Gaelic football at the weekend generally like I watched mm. Armagh West Meath and again quality not fantastic but it was exciting mm. like the, Morris Brosnan had a stat in that uh, Roscommon thing so in 31 minutes and 24 seconds Conor Carroll the Roscommon keeper taps the kick out to Brian Stack and they keep the ball so that's 31 and a half minutes they keep the ball to just over 37 minutes when Kieran Murda, Murda shoots and scores and in that 6 minutes nearly 6 minutes 77 passes 31 of them were kicked and Conor Carroll the keeper had 19 possessions in that play that could easily be changed you can't pass back the goalkeeper for one thing is yeah but I, do, I don't mind that yeah I, some people think that's horrendous yeah I actually think that's that's six, six minutes of possession that's beating Dublin at Dublin's game yeah so Dublin have to figure out getting the ball back so this yeah. is not a conversation that comes up like nearly every season when there's like one or two games that are like very heavy possession based and everyone gives off about it and then the next weekend there's an absolute cracker of a game and everyone just forgets about the argument again until it comes up a couple of weeks like it, I feel like we've been having this discussion since Perennial like discussion. Donegal yeah. Like first onto the scene basically and since then every year there's one team who's like ruining Gaelic football but it's actually a very successful tactic for the, I mean you saw mm. it was successful for us, for us at the weekend against Dublin why wouldn't you play like that like if these teams are actually able to form ways of beating the bigger teams the bigger clubs why would you do anything to curtail that because it's probably only going to play into the hands of like a Dublin Mayo Kerry whoever it is mm. I would have okay I think for the for the sake of the referee like there are 
things you can look at, right? Once you pass the halfway line, you can't come back. You can't go, come back from the other opposition half, for one thing. It's things like this need to be considered. The goalkeeper the rule, like th- yeah. a, a limit of like maybe a minute having the ball at any one time, something like that. I think you a can't take for, for like granted. A player that can only have the ball for a minute. No, a, a team. So you can't take for granted. Like that's these are just ideas. I, I, but like six oh. minutes of possession is um, by any metric that's an awful watch for a new. But is it not on? Was it not on Dublin in that six minutes to get the ball? Maybe off they're not that bothered about getting it back. Like, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. You can choose whether to press or not because it's t- yeah. very tiring not yeah. having the ball. Yeah, it's yeah. far less tiring for a team to have the ball and have possession to, and dictate it. Even mm. though you have the ball and you're still doing a lot of work. What do you have to do with the ball after a minute? Oh, you yeah. just cough it up like you give. If you don't do, and if you don't score, you just give the ball back. I'm just. I'm not suggesting this, but like I think something will probably change. You can't take for granted that people will keep watching Gaelic football in its current guys because people's attention span is bad, and you can you can audibly hear people talking throughout large swathes of inter-county All Ireland Gaelic football games now, and that's not great. Do you think any rule changes are designed to retain the converted, or to encourage a new mass of fans like? They probably thought that with the mark. You have a lot of a lot of people in the country can't stand football. Yeah, I think they, I think they thought with a number of rules. Oh, this is this is better. This is an improvement. The the mark has not worked at all. So you see the mark being used in, in not in the way it was intended. Mm. You know, not the high ball in the full forward line. It's mm. or, or the midfield. See, if I had a choice between a great getting football match and a great hurling one, I'd probably lean towards football. Yeah, if it's great. But I think there's far overall there's far worse football games than hurling ones. I think hurling's much easier to watch personally. I think you could argue with getting football that it, too easy is probably the wrong term, but there are too many options that you can do. Like you can do so much with the ball. You can there's so many things you can do even yeah. to score a point. This sounds insane. Parts of your body, you know. This sounds <laughs> that, insane. That's we, we, body, I, yeah. my we, we've, 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 we've arrived at a point where there are too many scores in hurling and football. There's not enough happening, and I don't know which. Sometimes I don't really want to watch either. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Like hurling, there are too many scores at the moment. Yeah, but it's I, too much strike basketball. I would argue there's far more skill required in hurling than football. Oh, there absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Is. I, I don't know. Can you argue there's too many scores? Like you watch Limerick at the weekend, and like that game was so tit for tat, up and down, and there was like scores going everywhere and. You didn't. It was like almost hard to watch because there was so much happening, and you're like, "Oh, what's the score? Okay, yeah, no, there's only two points in it. I thought there was like three with the amount of scores that have been happening, and it was class to watch because of the pace and the intensity, and like mm. you felt like you couldn't take a breath watching it because something would have happened. I, I find well, basketball the totally boring. The disinterest GA is, is as much about like the competition and the structures mm. as it is what's actually happening on the pitch. Like there have been plenty of unreal matches this season, and I, I don't know how many matches people would necessarily look at and say it was. Roscommon Dublin levels of possession base and that's what made it bad what made the other games bad is the fact that like there was a total difference between the teams that were facing off against each other and there was a clear winner going into every game before a ball was even kicked like mm. that was the issue with a lot of the games it wasn't the possession stuff well, ironically we've had very very close games in the group stages a lot of really close games so far um but I don't know. I mean, I, I know a lot of diehards who've just given up on Gaelic football watching it. That's the thing. They have been tight games. I actually think the first round of group get games have been good. They have been good. I thought they'd be dead rubbers, but they actually, mm. you forget how important it is to maybe top the group and avoid that extra game and get a mm. little bit more of a re- uh, bit, bit of rest straight through to the quarterfinals. So I think there's more jeopardy on the line than I Was there a, a mm. sweet spot for football in your lifetime? <laughs> I put that in the room. 2000, drawn all Ireland. Galway, Kerry, sitting in the yeah. lap. Yeah, I mean, not, I mean, a season or maybe yeah, a year or two. In terms of the quality of football um, yeah. and the rules as well, and the, and the and the approach to it in games, are they trying to change too much? I thoroughly enjoy like the mid noughties the Kerry Tyrone days, probably the best. I think maybe that's just my age, but I I I don't mind where football's at at the, min- at the minute. I think definitely there change could be anything. Rules. Um, definitely get rid of the advanced mark. Probably more encourage more kicking. That's kind of a, a theme in the comments here this morning as well. They have to change. Uh, Brian says they have to change the hand pass rules. Players need to be forced to kick the ball. The mark was a brutal idea. It's just how you encourage them to kick pass more. Maybe you need X number of. But then, you know, if you need X number of kicks before you can take a shot, and the a team has only taken three of their five kicks, and they all, all of a sudden have a shooting opportunity, and they have to turn back. Everyone's like, "This is stupid." Why have you an issue with uh, the back pass being brought in? I just what's the advantage of passing back to the goalie in terms of a spectacle? Well, certainly not in terms of a spectacle, but, but like should we be looking at sport in terms of a spectacle? Well, like, that's the thing; it's a sport. But, but 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 football brought it in, and it's it's much better for us. Like much much better for us. 
as in soccer it brought in the back pass rule when I was I remember I was told about when I was like under 12 or something it's a much much better game what is the benefit as a spectacle which is important because Gaelic football is not a good spectacle for much of the time for a lot of people what is the benefit of the goalkeeper being able to get the ball again and have like what was it 19 possessions in 6 minutes yeah I don't want to watch that like but 31 of those 77 passes were kicked at least you know so that could be kicked 2 yards like uh, yeah or kick to a fellow who was in, in loads of space I don't really see the, the negative of bringing in the back pass rule I don't know I, I just it, it'd be drastic I think it, w- it wouldn't be drastic you just don't give don't pass to the don't pass back to goalie pass back to one of the other 14 players I think referees at the moment in Gaelic football have, have way too much to be doing he yeah. About Harley. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. yeah, same as Harley. There should definitely be two referees in Harley, mm. for sure. Mm. Like, yeah. that's a no-brainer. I know it's going to be difficult to have that at club level, volunteers and all the, all the rest, but mm. certainly at county level, there has to be two referees. It's, I have to say, there, there are a few sports worse as a neutral if you're watching a Gaelic football game and one side is eight points clear with 10 minutes to go and they try to keep the ball yeah. and they're hand passing to each other. Don't like, it's it's, it's that, almost yeah. pointless to watch it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's impressive the retention mm. of the ball <laughs> and their composure. And it's one of the purists yeah their lack of urgency it's an impressive way to run down the clock but then you think to yourself Jesus what's this all about this is the what thing. are we here for so uh, when I was at the again I love bringing things back to snooker but when I was at the Crucible recently there was a match on between Gary Wilson and Mark Selby and it was if you weren't a snooker fan this was putrid stuff mm. at the, at oh the there's end examples of it. of it in every sport mm. but I think Gaelic football is one of the worst thing, but snooker yeah. purists love that frame mm. and like the players are nearly apologising after it but purists loved it because mm. it was so torturous and yeah. same with Gaelic football probably I don't whereas I don't think that's a thing in hurling for example there's, I don't think there is such a thing as maybe retaining possession yeah. and hurling is, is really not done like I mean there's far more passing and hurling now than there used to be mm. you know it used to be you just you know up the field like and that would be a roar and now what you're is keeping the all the ball what is the Gaelic football purist though like does the Gaelic football purist like marvel at six minute long possession or is the Gaelic football purist wants to see like the Galway team of 98 or that's you know that era where football was just a much more it was a simpler game it's a better game now clearly because it's evolved it's just less watchable well if you're a purist yeah. you probably enjoy every aspect of the game you, well, you don't well, enjoy hand passing the ball for six minutes. Like, you might, you might, you might, hat, you might you like know. the chest uh, nature of it. Yeah, mm. and it also depends on like if your team is playing and if they're like if you're a Roscommon supporter and you're mm. doing that against Dublin at the weekend and it's getting your results and it gets you a draw, which like sets you up very well going into the rest of the group stage. Like, of course you're gonna enjoy. It. Like, you might not enjoy it, but you're gonna enjoy the result out of it mm. in the moment. So you're not gonna mm. sit there and be like, oh god, I wish Davy Burke hadn't done that. Like, we should have been playing the ball a bit more. You're gonna be like, no, that was a success tactic for us fair play What? how can we use that later on presuming they get out of the group yeah some of the comments on this are interesting mm. uh, sorry, we weren't even supposed to be talking about no. football today it wasn't on the show no we did we put it to the top at the start did we yeah we uh, did just before we went live so we don't have a guest for a reason uh, Fergus Keogh says as with rugby too many people want to turn football into basketball with a score every other minute Danny Max says what kind of a cork man is Colin watching football before hurling but football no, is no I, I did say cork's a split card isn't it yeah well first of all it was well, card well, well, yeah, but I mean hurling would definitely be stronger but I did say when I said that that if it's a choice between two great matches one football one hurling I'd probably lean towards football but I'd watch way more hurling overall <coughs> right because hurling is consistently for me more entertaining than football I, like, and I also saw a comment that um, there are too many scores in hurling Like I don't really buy into that it's a bad thing I admire the accuracy yeah. the increase I think it's incredible to watch yeah I think I, I missed like four at the start of the game on yeah, Sunday there are and still you misses. were like wow well, this is going to be like mm. a ridiculously low scoring game and then it was ridiculously high like <laughs> but that point about the misses is, that's why I think it adds a bit of jeopardy because yeah. sometimes they do miss and I, I think the skill level is at an all time high it's, it's incredible it's, insane, yeah. it's, it's absolutely insane. amazing in the next 5-10 years the skill level is going to get to the point where the shooting accuracy is just an outrageous well, why, level why, are, why are we why are we criticising that like? no but I mean it's just then it's just a I guess it's a shootout no I think I think the only problem with that is it's almost alienating to the audience because it's like how could I ever do that replicate it maybe yeah. the skill level is just so high but I, f- I feel for the commentator because Darren Maloney can't keep saying that's a great score. He's had <laughs> 60 points in this game. They can't all be great. Uh, yeah. And it's, t- it's tough for the commentator because like, he's not a hurler. Now, hurlers just say, well, that's actually a run of the mill score. It's just one yeah. of like 136 to 227 today. That's, and that's the thing. Yeah. That's between like Westmead and Antrim, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so, and I'm, not, I, I'm not saying 
like Hurling's in an amazing place but I, I do find like the score has lost its value because there are so many scores in the game uh, it's entirely different to the Gaelic football conversation 100% happened, but that's because of the improvement of the sport like yeah. um, like pundits are becoming blasé about moments of magic yeah yeah. how can yeah, we ever get to that, that place I'd agree with that yeah. <laughs> we use too many uh, words of praise in football I think oh what a fantastic like, it, there's, it's just it's lost meaning at this point no but the, when you see a great goal scored in Gaelic football it's nothing like it as yeah, well yeah it's true but a, re- a truly great goal Francie Brady says Gaelic football must be the worst field game to watch at this point it's become unbearable um, Dwayne Griffin this is a good point why is possession seen as such a great thing to watch in soccer but not Gaelic football far more difficult to retain the ball in soccer than Gaelic football goes back to my point true, you have, you too, you have too many options in Gaelic football yeah. there's so many ways Holy and also, also, also tackling in Gaelic football it's really tough to get the ball back yeah. it's really hard like that's why Paul Galvin stood out so much for his trick to like smack the ball out of someone's hand you know like like soccer is it's really tough to keep hold of the ball in soccer yeah it is no it is, oh, it, is sure. it is it is that's why like the really good teams are amazing at it it's, it's an interesting talk about though because like some people at the minute are quite happy with Gaelic football and you talk to other people are like I can't watch it it's putrid at the moment so it no, definitely divides opinion I um, find it fascinating but as a neutral I don't find it fascinating for a team to have the ball for six minutes really it's just hard to enjoy them because they're literally killing the clock Yeah. like the longer we have the ball and the longer that Dublin don't have the ball the longer this is a non-event mm. essentially we don't really have an interest necessarily in scoring here we yeah. just have an interest in making this game as unwatchable as possible really that's what it is because it cuts out this as joy time mm. and that's not to say there's a, there is a bit of effort keeping the ball but not that much at times I might yeah. get you on this Johnny we could transition into our next topic here but Chris in the live comments says uh, watch the League of Ireland game and tell me GA is boring to watch did you see last Friday's games I didn't actually know I heard the Bowes Shells game was, was very poor which uh, ironically a lot is to do with Damien Duff's strategy with Shells but um, I, I, I think it's it's subjective as well I mean a lot of people will watch League of Ireland and think it's crap mm. um, but in fairness I think it's been very very watchable in recent years we've had a couple of bad games of late uh, Bring us nicely to the next topic and it's one that uh, is a little bit concerning because you think of years ago a couple of decades ago less even the amount of Irish players playing in the Premier League at that level um, and the stats for this season just gone 2022 to 23 season the Premier League 13 Irish players played in the Premier League season total of 9,320 minutes that's down from 14 players um, and down 620 minutes yeah. from the previous season so it's a new low um, in terms of Irish talent playing at the top well, level stats are from Philip Quinn in today's Irish Daily Mail so, right that's uh, that's concerning isn't it and also Philip goes on to compare it to even 10 years ago mm. far more and then the first season of the Premier League it was like so nine, nearly 9,500 minutes there was like 45,000 minutes <laughs> and it, like it's just because the market's opened up you can scout all over the world mm. suddenly Irish players aren't so attractive I don't yeah. think it's it's not like it's it's a historical outlier, but it's not a, a, an outlier at all. Now, in terms of no Irish managers hardly at all in, in English football anymore. Like really a handful. Mm. Um, it's very very hard for the Irish players, considering our ranking, to make an imprint in the Premier League. Which, as Colin says, is I mean, look at the managers in the Premier League. Like the level of like Ancelotti's last job in England was managing Everton. Like you know, yeah. like, like the managerial. Um, his talent is so so strong there's incredible money in it and for Irish players to get in I think we're going to have to improve but I don't really think it's that big of a deal to be honest I think that's where we're at um, we're a small country we have a lot of players playing at the championship which is an ing- championship's one of the top what 10 leagues in the world yeah. we have a lot of players playing there I was um, going to say I'd be curious to see what the figures were for like championship or say lower leagues as well like have they gone up or increased or like what's the historical tracking of those over the last couple of seasons like are we suffering there in the same way mm. the Premier league is that a complete downward trend throughout the leagues in England or is it just that kind of higher echelon yeah I mean the closest Irish Premier League manager we're going to have soon is probably Paddy McCarthy or Crystal Palace mm. if uh, Roy Hodgson does maybe another year and then um, upsteps McCarthy from the wings but yeah it's not looking good there I mean I, I do think it's a bit concerning because the Premier League is obsessed over in Ireland it's also the and to not have players I mean like the the player who played by far the most this season is Gavin Bazunu who yeah. got relegated with Southampton mm. and if it wasn't for Evan Ferguson this would really be an adir. Yeah, Ferguson is the and, and like Ferguson scored was it six league goals and made his debut on St. Stephen's Day mm. and got injured as well yeah so he didn't play that much really yeah. overall but he was just so impressive when he did play and then after that like the, the list quickly diminishes like Seamus Coleman again got injured he's out of contract don't know if he's going to play for Everton look the bright point Burnley and Sheffield United are in the Premier League next season there you have John Egan Enda Stevens, Josh Cullen yeah. provided they stay and play so that will be improved upon but 
But you're, 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 you're like we should not, not be crazy. obsessed with <coughs> essentially the only league that is not in the EU as well like so we, we can't even send players over until they're 18 now the mm. link between the two countries um, which is obviously going back 800 years is being broken up a little bit because of Brexit and we are now necessarily sending young players to other leagues and the obsession with English football hasn't been healthy for this country either and we shouldn't be that worried that the Premier League that the numbers are pretty much what they should be considering like Ireland haven't been great for, for a long time I think we're working on it I'd be more encouraged by how the under 17s performed in defeat against Spain the numbers of Irish players in England I really would like and I think the fascination and the obsession with England like hasn't been a good thing for us at all where we felt it was okay just to send kids over at any age under the sun and wish them the best of luck and they came back with their tails between their legs and were you know unable to make it as footballers because of the English machine but we didn't have anything to offer them in Ireland that's what we should look at focus on our own game why does Damien Duff not Damien Duff wants to maybe manage Ireland but other than that he's happy to manage the League of Ireland because he sees the potential of it mm. and if he sees it maybe the rest of us should see it as well like well we were having exactly this conversation last night on the Koi Gig podcast which is in your feeds now if you want to listen to it but um, in relation to the WSL and the fact that four Irish players are out of contract at the moment possible out of them maybe one is going to play in the WSL next season the rest will probably all go down to the championship obviously Grace Maloney has also been relegated with Reading and Emma Byrne was making exactly the point that you're making there Johnny of like we have this obsession with sending young players to England she's like why not give the if they want to go and play abroad like if they want to have that chance outside of the leagues in Ireland why not send them to Spain like why not spend send them to Italy why not get them to have some experience in France why do we always need to obsess over whether our players are in in the WSL or the Premier League like we were talking about both leagues she was like there are so many great leagues across Europe that our players could benefit from but we seem to have been like very blinkered over and I know it's like history and it's closer and for a long time it was a lot easier to get to England and it seemed you know it's not as much of a culture shock as it may be going to somewhere else but why why are we so focused on having our players in the English league and not somewhere else where they and if they come back you know if someone plays in Spain for three years and comes back they're going to play an entirely different set of football and it's going to be only a benefit then for say national teams that they may be playing in whether that's underage whether that's at senior level we see it with Amber Barrett the fact that she's played in Germany for so long like Mm. she comes back and she has a totally different style of football to any of the players that play in the WSL we see it with the ones like Heather Payne who plays over in the States or Denise O'Sullivan they come back and they offer something completely different to us so why why focus so much on the English side of things why that's an interesting point that you like so we discussed how the Irish so what is it 13 Irish players in the Premier League last year mm. and our international team as you say isn't at the heights that it once was but the women's team is in the World Cup and yet the numbers don't seem that different like it, it, are, yeah, there, any, are yeah. there more than 13 the impact, it's, the yeah, but it's, the, it's the impact far more impact on WSL than yeah. in Premier League like like the Irish players in the Premier League the 13 are largely peripheral mm. outside of the three that yeah. I mentioned but also Big what clubs, you're seeing yeah. now with the WSL is like there is that drain happening where more and more of our players are landing in the championship than ever before whereas before we would have had you know like obviously we have Kane McCabe big name one of the best players in the WSL but apart from that the majority of our players are playing for championship teams and it looks like they're going to continue that way rather than making the sort of impact that they have done in the WSL and that's because of the same way it went with the Premier League being able to scout further afield being able to bring more money coming into the league and Irish girls and women just not being able to compete in the same way that they maybe did before when there was less choice and opportunity which is why like I think this is an important discussion to be having now especially for like the FAI and stuff thinking well like okay if we are going to produce keep producing talents like Kayla McCabe Janice O'Sullivan Heather Payne whoever it is what, what can we be doing to make sure that that continues whether it's increasing the league here whether it's like building opportunities with you know academies in mainland Europe or with colleges in the states like that's where we need to be looking mm -hmm. now at all those opportunities so that say 10 years 20 years down the line because obviously the men's game is more advanced at the moment in terms of the development we're not looking at the Premier League or the WSL and thinking oh god we used to have so many top yeah. players and now we have 
like Bazunu who's played the most amount of minutes and is being relegated or Kelleher who comes on and lets well. four sorry, goals in yeah. sorry Laz I think a good example is if you brought anyone along to see Patrick McElhinney Jack Byrne or Graham Burke play in the League of Ireland or see what they've done in European football see McElhinney's goals the, 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 see what Jack Byrne has done see some of Graham, Graham Burke's goals the three of them were effectively flops in Britain right I mean yeah. McElhinney and Jack Byrne ended up at Oldham right and they weren't really doing much Oldham was a basket case Graham Burke went to Preston I remember Shawnee McGuire telling me Graham Burke is the best player in training didn't really work out from there they're all happy to be playing in Ireland they generally are and we should be really really proud of the quality that we have in the League of Ireland the technical quality Jack Byrne's best spell of football was in Holland it wasn't in England because mm. he was more suited to it and we've this obsession with the English game and I, I'm not saying English football is bad to watch but like as you go down the leagues um, you know a lot of these Irish players are actually they would be better playing as Kathleen alludes to there in other countries and because of we, we have a lot of dual nationality potential players now coming through with yep. like maybe African heritage or in, in, in some cases like Albanian heritage stuff like that where they would be probably those kids would probably be more inclined to maybe move to a non-English speaking country because culturally it's not that different to them as well and this is a good thing and Brexit has brought all this about and I'm delighted it has because it's forced us to look after our own and it might force the government into actually helping us for once no, that's, all, like, that's all great and I agree with it but I think the reason we're talking about the Premier League and WSL is that they're two elite leagues right so we as a nation have massive ambition for our national sides yeah. so you often hear the criticism of Vera Powell's team is that the football isn't great but it's, it can be very effective but the, like the possession stats aren't great can't really keep the ball that well probably the opposite is labelled at Stephen Kenny largely is that the football's okay mm. results aren't good so it all goes back to our players on both sides not enough of them are playing at the absolute top level of the game so the Premier League and WSL is just an example of two leagues that they could be playing in of course we're going to mention the Premier League it's the one that we follow the most that's the one we talk about the most yeah. so if our players at the top level aren't playing in those leagues enough and we have this huge ambition, which I think is out of proportion for what we are as a nation, on both the men's and women's side to be really high achieving football sides because we're a football obsessed country. Mm. It but, is concerning that they're not playing. But that's also like, I I get what you're saying, but I think it's also it's slightly to the side of what Johnny and I are saying in the sense that there is a certain, uh, like obviously, yeah, Premier League, greatest league in the world. But when you look at the teams Irish players could be playing for, you know, like Katie McCabe could go play for Leon, and she would be as successful as she is at Arsenal. Like yeah. there are Premier League players that say Irish players are playing the Premier League right now who could go to another league, whether it's like the Eredivisie or. <coughs> La Liga or something and do really well there and it's not the fact like and I know people will say okay well that's not the same level as the Premier League but if they're successful there if it suits their style of football if they're playing the best they can play that is beneficial for the Irish national teams and like if we I think sometimes ugh, there's like a snobbery sometimes that comes with the Premier League and I'm not saying Colm that you're being a snob in the argument that you're making I'm just saying there's a snobbery sometimes that comes with the Premier League like if you're playing in the bottom six teams of the Premier League and you could be playing in the top four of a slightly lower league or say like the top half of a slightly lower league and doing well and winning trophies and being successful surely that's as beneficial as Bazunu in Southampton again he's a very easy option now but you know what I mean or like even Coleman at Everton that's what I'm saying but like the Eredivisie is a good example that, that's just as good I'm not. Ta- I'm the Premier League and WSL are two examples, not mm. the leagues that you have to play in. There's not enough players playing at the elite level of the game. Yeah, we and I think also, if, like. if you're bottom four in the Premier League, that's no problem, like because you're mm. playing against quality every single mm. week. Like if if a player plays abroad at a top level club, like in one of the European Central leagues, that's fantastic. But are you damaging? Your but the problem is, there's there's ambitions. too many there's too many championship players. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the ambition that we have as a well. nation, we're never going to be happy. Like, because how many times do we uh, debrief a Republic of Ireland game, either Vera Power or uh, Stephen Kenny's side, mm. and we're highly critical of it yeah. the next day because we're out of proportion with the reality of where our players are playing. So it is concerning. Yeah, it's mm. a difficult one. I, I do think the obsession with going to England has count, has definitely has has, yeah. It's an it. example. It's not mm. it's not the be all and end all. Yeah. It's an example of yeah. what we talk about every day. Yeah. And there's not enough Irish players there. But if an Irish player is playing anywhere in Europe, brilliant, as long as it's top level. I not enough top level players. Obviously more Irish players in the Bundesliga or the Eredivisie. Mm. Brilliant, yeah. I was yeah. all about it. But that will happen. You, you see examples of that, like uh, the kids going off to Udinese, um, a banquet and Fessi, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also just the whole, the whole Brexit thing should encourage... Um, we've seen like f- 
French clubs buy players like uh, Pat's player went to France um, at a young age and it should encourage <coughs> Brexit should encourage EU countries to look into this as, as potential because say Mason Melia now who's like what is he he's under 17 he's 15 years of age isn't he next year yeah he's still under 17 next year so he, as far as I know his parentage is entirely Irish but there'll be a lot of kids of his uh, age who you, who will be you know attracting the interest of clubs in, in Europe yeah. um, who can't go to Britain until they're 18 which is right. absolutely great as far as I'm concerned because um, we have to develop them here yeah let's turn things on its head 8.04am on this Tuesday morning's to I just want to briefly mention what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock uh, this morning we have Alan Quinlan standing by very shortly to reflect on Munster's win at the weekend in South Africa he was there Jasmine Baba at 8.25am uh, talking Borussia Dortmund and they really I'm not going to say battled the Bundesliga but uh, they, they, they battled uh, they battled let's, let's say battled go on Colin we'll, we'll use that word uh, the draw with Mainz at home was just they lost so or sorry they lost and Bayern get the oh, did they lose? yeah they lost yeah. they lost Bayern, one. Their first, their, they hadn't lost at home since the 20th of August Bayern and they lose the Mainz who were useless yeah um, but like it's one it's one of those moments in, in you're just like oh, these lads no, Dortmund, Dortmund drew at home in the last game, did they not? They, they, I think they lost 2-1. Either way, they battled it. Yeah, yeah. Well, someone let us know in the comments. Um, but either way, that's going to be discussed with Jasmine Baba. 2-2 draw. 2-2 right, draw. Sorry. Jasmine Baba, but they lost it. football analyst. So she, she's joined us different times before talking about Borussia Dortmund and Jude Bellingham will, will be part of that conversation as well. Uh, Sports News at 8.40. We'll have Eddie Dunbar at 8.50. Really looking forward to that chat. He uh, had a brilliant Giro d'Italia uh, over the last uh, number of weeks and a uh, top 10 finish, which he was targeting as well. And Dervil O'Rourke in 10 past 9 talking uh, Rashida Adelecki amongst other things things uh, but uh, now it's five past nine uh, five past eight nine. I'm now ahead of myself here uh, dying to go I know listen listen to me I should mention Brayburn Coffee as you see there is the official coffee partner of OTB Brayburn Coffee is coming to an Apple Green near you new Brayburn locations popping up every month so visit applegreenstores.com forward slash Brayburn to find your nearest Brayburn Coffee experience up next Alan Quinlan as I said will be in studio first though Tommy Welch was with Joe last night reflecting on the Limerick Cork hurling classic a quick one um, you mentioned Galan Rolls Royce and he's good at everything he's crafty uh, <laughs> it's a euphemism and uh, he's obviously just a phenomenal forward who can do everything if you were set it, setting out to mark him in a game and thinking about him how would you go about trying to stop him? Well, I definitely wouldn't be standing in front of him for a high ball or that way <laughs> yeah so ah listen you, you couldn't stand in front of him because he, he'd you know when that ball's coming in you, you're not going to get near because whatever will move your hurler hand in, in the way it'll be gone out of it and he'll have that ball caught he's so strong he's so physically strong I think first of all you have to match him physically and that's where Clare will be under a bit of pressure in the Munster final and that Conor Cleary seems to be injured whether yeah. he'll make a back or not he was able to give him a great battles over the last couple of games because um, and you need help um, like great def- great defences uh, defend the numbers they don't defend on their own and um, if you're to mark a land you're going to need plenty of help from your from your half back line and probably your centre back who's trying to cover back with you but how would you go about marking him you'd want to get the ball before he does anyway um, it was George he was a great coach of ours he, he, he said you know he won't be good if he doesn't have the ball and the great players you just can't because they make a fool yeah. and um, Galan is just in that form at the moment but high low to the, it, it, the runs are, are brilliant as well and a lot goes back to the management as well and the way Canurk and, and Kylie have trained these guys so I know I referenced it before but he didn't touch a ball for 36 minutes and I think it could have been the league semi-final and John Kylie was after was asked about it afterwards and he straight away said the opportunity wasn't there to give him in the ball which in my head means that if it's not man on man in there, Galan is not going to get the ball. That they'll mess around with Morrissey to, to you know O'Donovan to Will O'Donoghue, and then maybe Burns will pop the ball over the bar. So he is definitely you know getting absolutely wonderful supply of ball from his uh, backs uh, and midfield when it does come in. OCB AM, the Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. OTB Rugby It's what you believe in and if you think it's going to work then train it There's no way as a coach you can say that I have an experienced rationale above my players on something like the wall You know, it's really let's see does this work together and then if you get a good vibe off it let's bring it in if you don't alright, cut Subscribe to the Rugby Stream on the OTB Sports app now OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. 
8.08 a.m. on this Tuesday morning's OTBM and on the back pages of uh, plenty of the papers this morning some uh, some beautiful images of the Munster celebrations after winning the URC the first trophy for Munster in 12 years uh, back at the Irish Daily Mail there Munster faithful <laughs> salute their heroes lovely sunny evening in Thoman Park uh, plenty of sunglasses I'm sure hiding some tired and possibly hungover eyes from uh, a multitude of the, the Munster players and well deserved thousands of Munster fans in the in, in Thoman Park we actually have a video here this is from the Munster Rugby official Instagram account and captures just some of the uh, celebrations last night. Have a look. We're going to keep the mics up. Look at that, lads. Yeah, that is pretty class. And got the weather as well. Mm. You're going back a long time, Quinny, for Anthony. Like, what we're talking, 12 years. Like, any scenes like this in Thomas Park we going back a long time. Yeah, it's... Um, it's wasn't expected, Johnny. Mm. I think. Um, what odds would you have gotten at the start of the season? Leinster win nothing and Munster win more than they do. I don't know. It'd be mm. Crazy, really, but um, unexpected. But it probably makes it a little bit more sweeter. You know, they've been in a couple of finals since since 2011, 12 season, and um, 2017. I thought they'd win it against mm. the Scarlets. They were in a strong position there. They were pretty. Uh, showed a bit of good bit of form in the build up to that and in Europe as well and they got walloped by the Scarlets 2015 against Glasgow and Belfast again optimism there you can beat Glasgow Glasgow were brilliant blew them away and, and I think two two years ago against Leinster when there was no crowds mm. um, they were dominated they never fired a shot in that game that was actually a very frustrating one for me two years ago I was, I was at the game there was no crowds and um it was probably in the manner the manner in which they played. Yeah. And I think if you take some of those players out now who maybe were playing or involved and and you ask them to separate um what's different now and, and you know, is it more enjoyable? I'd mm. say it's it's like night and day really because in that final they never fired a shot, their box kicking a lot, um no expansive style to their game, no of course, they're trying their hearts out and they're trying to contain a Leinster side that day. And But you look at Saturday and you think, God, even when they went behind... Um, they always felt they were there. Feel, yeah, you feel that they feel now that they can they can hurt the oppositions, they can go after them. Um, so the way they've attacked all season has been remarkable. I think the start is well documented when you lose five of your first seven games in any mm. league or any sport. Um you're not you're not being considered Probably, as a league yeah. contender so yeah the, I think as well and, and the players and coaches have acknowledged it remarkably well and um, the fans have been through a lot of torment and you know they keep spending the money and they keep going and travelling you were in Cape Town what, what, like, what was the atmosphere was like amongst the market? yeah it was amongst remarkable it was um, it was amazing to see so many there and and so vocal um and just the excitement and the, the passion they showed and you know it was I just had a, it had a real surreal feeling about it um, the weather was horrendous there on Thursday it was lashing rain all day uh, but people were jovial and confident and we had um, you know we had an event on Friday night where, where some of the Munster party came in the coaches and it was a lovely event and uh, you just had a sense that they were going to kind of die with their boots on they were going to throw everything at it and you feel there's a different feel about this group and this yeah. players so they built something they deserve the credit themselves between the coaches and the players and you know anyone who coaches a team you know and I always say to my own son it's about togetherness and and you know that's the remarkable thing about sport is is Sometimes you may not be the best and most skillful and most talented group. And I, I'm not saying that to be any way disrespectful, but their collective recently has been phenomenal and they've been really brought together by the challenges of, of going away. Like six, seven weeks ago, we're looking at doom and gloom. Um, Glasgow wallop them in Thomond Park. They're 29 nil down at half time. There's a neary silence. Um, they needed to win that game at the time. We're thinking it's a home game to get into the playoffs. Maybe looking at top four, which would be a brilliant return. Top four scenario, be knocked out in the playoffs and qualify for Europe. 
a lot of boxes ticked yeah. new coaching team progress made safety and kind of Champions League qualification for next season uh, they lose that game um, it's doom and gloom you're heading to South Africa you're going playing the Stormers the current champions and the Sharks who walloped them uh, in the Champions Cup and you're thinking whoa um, trouble we're in trouble here we could be 7th or 8th here in the league and then 7th or 8th possibly wasn't making Europe 8th didn't make Europe because of the um, the uh, pool qualifications from, from the other countries and uh, so it wasn't looking good so they, what they did is they had to kind of really galvanise um, pull together obviously had to play as well and they learned a lot from the, the trip to the Sharks really about not mm -hmm. being loose making sure you stop their mall at source trying to get your set piece better than what it was uh, breakdown issues like if you go to that Sharks game in the Champions Cup and you look at the the difference in the breakdown to Saturday night my god it was just phenomenal even watching the ball the game back like every single player in the field their energy and reaction yeah. to clean out a Stormers player if if there's a poacher coming in or if there's a danger even the counter rock and to be so strong in their position their body language so it's remarkable and I think they're the things that I look back and when I watch the game again um, Jack Crowley going in cleaning out breakdowns like one player at times like just been so strong Gavin Coombs there you know he blocks down Manny Libok at the end of the game mm. uh, 73rd Usual. minute yeah. like again these are little things that you can take out of work rate honesty passion desire stuff that I've always said is an integral part of the jersey and I still believe that I'll never change I'm not saying I was perfect with it all the time I wasn't I was often you know and needed to you know you need to get the emotion right but I just see Gavin Coombs and people have questioned him at times is he going to be good enough does he have the minerals uh, to step up and challenge well I tell you in recent weeks he has shown some balls yeah answer some questions. fire some passion you know the carries the clean outs just the work off the ball and that's I'm sure that's what the Irish coaches have told him this is the stuff you need to get better at that thing about the, the Sharks game and, and Munster's improvement since the South African team seem to have brought the the rest of the teams in the URC to another level well they've made sure that if you're they're literally saying to the South African teams if you come in a little bit airy fairy and you're a bit off it we're going to smash you wide open so they make you really focus and that, I, when I said that was a big learning point in the Champions Cup Munster were just getting counter rocked they were getting driven off the ball they were getting turned over you know loose ball try <coughs> a concession all that kind of stuff um, the, the accuracy and the detail around their breakdown recently has been superb you know the, the, like as I said if you watch the game back some of the clean outs the possession the way they've held on to the ball one of the stats going into into the, the final was uh, again and it's it's remarkable Munster have had the most rocks in the URC this year right again if you're not scoring does it really matter if you're holding on to the ball but they've shown and proved that um, they're trying to play and they're they're trying to go at teams and there's multiple multiple rock situations where they're they're just holding on to the ball, so they've improved r remarkably and there's players here that I I genuinely and I think they can understand it too. Some people would have questioned: Are they good enough for this mm -hmm. level? Do they have what it takes to challenge you know and step up against other international players, particularly in Europe? Um, but that. URC scenario that's as close that's you're getting up there now to test match level the intensity of that game was was unbelievable so there's a lot of them have really given themselves a real shot in the arm as regards putting their hands up for selection maybe today when Andy Farrell names his squad mm -hmm. but also uh, kind of telling people you know I have it I can do something here there's certain parts of my game need to be better but I think you know the real fundamentals are that that energy and that accuracy around you look at someone like Gary Ringrose just the way what a natural mm -hmm. talent but you look at Gary Ringrose's biggest strengths nowadays there's all that defensive work it's the tackling it's the cleaning out of breakdowns and I think some of these players Munster players are starting to 
realize this is okay I can be nice and skillful and I can do well but this is the stuff that I can really get better at and they've shown it Gavin Coombs a prime example a wonderful player very talented unbelievably big powerful biggest strength scores loads of tries but honestly see him the other day cleaning breakdowns out knocking two Stormers guys away from the ball you know they had Dion Free playing they picked him for a reason he's the turnover machine I'm not sure he got one turner. I don't think yeah. he get, got any in the game. So their accuracy around the breakdown was phenomenal. You know, the way they held on to that ball in the first half. You know, I've criticised Munson before, Shane. Um, I've got flack for it. You've I, had and, to this and, season. And it isn't a kind of a sub story scenario that I'm looking for and, and back from it. I, I, it. They've frustrated me. They've frustrated some of the other Munster fans. And some of it may be over the top some of it justified whatever people's views are on that and, and I got no pleasure in, in any way out of that I love Munster and they're my team and when you play that long for me you don't, it doesn't ever change um, I watched the Kevin Moran programme last night on RT about Manchester United and I was just going yeah it's you know the way he goes back and it's in you whatever you know, team is your team you that's it and um, but I think what we've seen in the last seven or eight months really has given the whole organisation a shot in the arm and the coaches have been central to that. On that, do you think that like the players bought into Roundtree even at the start and they were like, okay, we're changing something here, let's trust him and there was a togetherness there where they felt that they were on a journey where this will improve? Yeah, I was always pro giving Ram Roundtree Dr- mm. the job because um, I think he, he obviously was there with the last group of, of coaches coaches but I think he he's a people's guy as well mm. you know what I mean he's really connected with the fans and that stuff he, he's making a lot of effort to to kind of engage fan engagement and stuff like that he knows the, the similarities with his club Leicester and <coughs> he did back great battles with them in Europe over the years and he feels that that's an important part of it which it is you know the Munster fans have been phenomenal and the way they travel again but I think he's done a great job I think he obviously gets the players and they respect him even you know throughout the whole season it's been a very happy camp and it's not necessarily that they've been winning all the time mm. the start of this the competition Johnny five losses and seven and the two wins out of that were one against um, Zebra with down in Cork and they scored three tries yeah. and it was very underwhelming uh, performance and the other one was the Bulls and Thoman Park which was better but you know there's been some really disappointing ones at the start you know they after they beat the Bulls they lost to Leinster and then at home to Ulster and you're thinking the doom and gloom is back a little bit but um, there's no by no means are they a finished article or anything and, and the reality here is you know Leinster opened the door here yeah and Munster went right through it <laughs> you know w- was it was it November in Parky Cueve that South Africa A match was that the turning point I, I was there for that and I did commentary for that game and I really think I, I saw do you know the way sometimes you get a feeling that there's something there that mm. needs to be tapped into and um I just saw them. I, re- I saw the start of a culmination of maybe what they were trying to do on the training pitch was starting to come into fruition. A bit of a togetherness. You have two wingers who've played all season, uh, mostly Nash and Daly, and they've been outstanding. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, it was so brilliant to see Keith coming off the bench and being involved a couple of weeks ago in the Stormers we thought his career was done and over with the injury and that he wouldn't come back and play for Munster I was everyone was so delighted to get on the field and be involved um, but the two wingers this year have been absolutely brilliant coming in off their wings being playmakers we're crying out for that for a couple of years um, but that South African game and I, I think Shane Daly scored in that match as well they were they were. it was the start of something and the evidence is there given the results because um, they following week to beat Connacht um, at home yeah they then went to Edinburgh the start of December All Edinburgh had all their internationals back from the November internationals and I was gone it's going to be a tough one if you picked up something here even a losing bonus point they have to scramble for every point yeah. now given the start they had they beat Edinburgh 38-17 and that one is not be, is not talked about a lot but I think that's up there I know Edinburgh have had a very topsy-turvy season but there was so many Scottish internationals in that team that night and Munster were brilliant they then went to North uh, then they 
they lost at home to Toulouse in the Champions Cup 18-13 which was um you know, a bit of a hammer blow for them. Um, they could have easily won that game at Thomond Park, but then they went to Northampton, um, won away there no, uh, at home at Christmas. I think the Leinster one was right there from to win. Yeah. And uh, but Leinster were brilliant to get the result. They beat them twenty nineteen, and then they go to Belfast. The one in Belfast mm-hmm. is talked about a fair bit. Um, the try late on to win that game so they've shown a lot of character and fight um, so that that does obviously it comes from players within but it also comes from coaches giving you confidence and you know, Andy Kiriakou Mike Prendergast and Dennis Leamy um, they've done a great job you know there's a smile on the players faces and they've got progressively better throughout the season mm. I remember talking to um you know, to, to Prendy after the Glasgow game and they were in shock as well a few weeks ago. But I think part and parcel of and people probably looks what well, what's the pivotal moment here? Maybe it's that Glasgow game. Yeah. Maybe it's they had their off night that they kinda of turned up to the game and thought, you know, we've been on a nice little run here, we've we've a chance now, we beat Glasgow and we've a you know, we're safe. We don't have to get Anton really in South Africa then if we get five points here against Glasgow. They got to kick up the backside, didn't they? You yeah. know, a real wake-up call, and um, you know, you talk about emotion and attitude and having that. It can happen any team. Mm. Really good teams even have that moment during the season that they were just not at it. And it's that word you use there, togetherness, when you talk about the even the link between the players and the fans. It almost was a disconnect before the South Africa A game and before that. You, you put up a great tweet last night, and we were talking about the scenes <laughs> in in, uh, in Thoman Park yesterday. You said, "If anyone spots my mum in Thoman Park tonight, tell her to go home." She She's only back from Cape Town this morning and on the tear again. She told me earlier that she was very tired of going to bed early and then I get sent pictures of her in the middle of it and Roger replies, Mary is more cracked than you. <laughs> well, I knew Roger would come back with that. Yeah, Roger would always slag me. and uh, uh, Yeah, well, I was better than I was. <coughs> I was, um, she's more cracked than me because I had to always mind Ron and put him to bed and stuff when he <laughs> when he went wild. Um, would that be his side of the story as well? Or the, yeah. yeah, he knows I always I watched him. And maybe that was a bad thing because he could... He could um, he knew I'd make sure he got home to bed safe and minded him. Um, but you know what? It, there's there's more mums like my mum out there that, you know, it means a lot to them. And I yeah. think that's... I got emotional on Saturday in commentary because um, it is very special. And you, look, none of us are feeling, God, we're, we're back. Mm. This is... We're going to win the European Cup next year. We're going to win the league. The challenge for him now... And you know what? So be it enjoy the moment now because this is a story of you know real kind of resilience as well and if you lose seven games in the league and draw one so out of 18 games you've you've won 10 games and you've really just roll you roll up your sleeve finish fifth and to come from where they <clears throat> they came from you know even Glasgow away there in that that quarter final um They've shown a doggedness here that that <clears throat> they're great things that you can have. You know, if you have all the skills in the world and you're lacking heart and passion, well, it's hard to kind of build that in a team. So a lot of the good fundamentals are there. Of course, they've got to get better um, and develop, and there's still more depth needed in, in certain areas of the team. So um <clears throat> There's no, there's no one going to get carried away here and think that this is, this is now months are back and they're going to win European Cups and URCs every year. They've got to work hard on it. But you know the lovely part about this, Shane, is they have reconnected with the fans. They've given a little bit of joy and hope. And uh, <coughs> I know people, I met people in Cape Town who I remember when I met my debut back in 96, 97, Munster, who were part of a tiny cohort of people who went to Cardiff, to Harlequins, to those for, your first European games that I played in mm. 1997. So to see those people still there, um, they've aged a bit, we all have, but um, it's special for them. So it was really good to see it. And I think, I keep saying it, Graham Roundtree, and the whole group deserve massive credit because they were unfit at the start of the season mm. for the type of game they were trying to play and they got it right so not just the coaches but the fitness people and every all the backroom Steve there's a big effort gone in there really with your backs against the wall so we and I said I'll say it again Leinster opened the door here with the semi-final 
okay, if Leinster picked a full team, it's highly, highly unlikely. But you, what we've seen from this team and the fight that they've shown, who who knows? I'm Leinster not, were missing players as well. It has to be like only a few players, but yeah, yeah, they were missing, were missing kind of crucial players. But um, there's so many players in this group who've really enhanced themselves, you know, and and um, put themselves in a place where where they can now kind of walk with their chests around a little bit, which is great for the first preseason in yeah. a long time. We're we're bang out of time, Connie, but very briefly, just the the Irish squad being named today the 45 man squad so that'll be a course cut to 33 for the World Cup but really if you're not picked in the 45 today then your chances of playing the World Cup are slim so the likes of Hodnett, Nash, Klein would you expect them to be, to be included? I, I don't know about expected but I think they should be Shane Daly, Calvin Nash um, John Klein for me has been unbelievable and I think he deserves another shot at it I think he's been dismissed after 2019 he played eight, started 18 or 19 games this year and his skills have improved dramatically his work rate is through the roof and I think he deserves a shot at it John Hodnett Gavin Coombs um Mike Haley had a great game the other day. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of competition for sure. But there's certainly guys here, as I said, to play the other day that Andy Farrell and, and his coaches would look at and say, right, OK, that's a high level now. Mm. John Hodden out in that field looked like a machine. He's chopping tackles. Yeah. And they're Springboks. They're big, strong, powerful guys. He's charging up the wing. He scores a brilliant try. Um so yeah there's a there's a couple of players here who who definitely will feel very hard done by and it'll be a shame if they're not in the mix and and I keep saying it John Klein he should be in there yeah we'll keep a good eye on that squad it'll be fascinating to see what 45 players Andy Farrell laps for later on today Quinny great stuff thanks for coming Thank in sure. as per usual at eight, uh, approaching 8.30 on this Tuesday morning's OTB and we turn our attention to football and uh, matters in Germany in the Bundesliga because it was a, a fascinating finish to the Bundesliga season at the weekend uh, Borussia Dortmund as we said earlier uh, gifting Bayern an 11th straight bonus league title Dortmund drawing at home 2-2 to Mainz that allowed Bayern to win the title they won 2-1 at home to Cologne uh, and goal difference was the, was the uh, difference in the end football analyst Jasmine Babbitt joins us on the show this morning Jasmine how are things good morning all good a bit tiring after a very busy weekend but uh, I think everyone's feeling the burn of the end of the season right now so yeah very busy in Germany it was crazy so maybe for people who haven't, who haven't seen this Jasmine what happened <laughs> well, Dortmund went quite early down to at home to Mainz where they only needed to win. I think the pressure of all of the country, apart from Bayern fans and obviously their rivals, Schalke fans, um, wanting them to win, I think broke them somewhat. Um, so, yeah, they went 2-0 down um, and... In the in the uh, adjacent game in Bayern Munich, they went one 0 up quite early, so it looked like it was all going to be fine for Bayern Munich from that time. However, Cohen, who was playing against Bayern, had a penalty to make it one one. All of a sudden, uh, Dortmund were back in the driving seat. Dortmund did manage to turn it around in the second half and to make it two two, but in the 89th minute, Bayern Munich took the lead through uh, Jamal Musiala to snatch the title away. So very dramatic last day. We don't usually get this on the last day, especially in terms of title challenge. But this weekend we had the championship, uh, the top four and relegation to play for on the final day. So it was a very exciting time, especially when it was won by Bayern Munich that late. Jasmine, I, I think I'm right in saying this when Bayern lost to Leipzig on the 20th, um, which is Saturday beforehand, um, they were 1-0 up, conceded three goals, fans were leaving, they were literally leaving the ground, possibly, a, definitely a 3-1, possibly a 2-1, um, and whether, I've seen this being described as indifference about just, you know, it, did, it didn't matter that if they won it or not again because they're just so used to it, or maybe they'd given up, so how did this happen? Um, I think... It, there is a, a theory to be had that some of the players that are so used to winning the league, they don't know how to put up a challenge anymore. And um, they're not experienced in actually challenging <coughs> things. And that's why it looks so... Sometimes when they're really, really pushed, they don't know how to get over it. And I think the kind of inconsistency of changing manager throughout makes it even harder to work with. But I think... 
this has been brewing. I don't think this is suddenly a surprise that Bayern Munich are just looking a bit more shaky than they have done. They have had, and this is basically why their CEO, Oliver Kahn, and sporting director, Hassan Salihamidzic, were fired just before the final match day. These struggles have come from kind of decisions in recruitment. Um, if we think about Flank Ribéry um, being replaced with the likes of Serge Gnabry and Leroy Sane, um, they've gone for, if you go through their recruitment process, they've gone for more... Um, young talent and hope rather than experienced winners and that they have to always put this kind of progression in their players rather than having something that's there you and then there's the other side of it that they haven't replaced some players at all they haven't really replaced tiago they haven't they hadn't replaced Lewandowski in the same kind of profile types. So it's no wonder that they're struggling and failure, failure to fix this, which it looks like they're trying to make amends for with those two firings higher up, um, failure to do so that we might actually see a different title winner um, next year. What was the celebration like in in Munich was it kind of like oh yeah we, we actually we, we won actually did we uh, yeah, it just doesn't feel the same um, I would say that the celebration this year was a lot more hyped than the celebration last year right. last year because I think they kind of walked over it and you have mm. to remember Dortmund had both Bellingham and Erling Haaland and didn't really give them any competition so it kind of seemed Board from the players last season. This season, I think because it was so late, because they had to fight, the celebration was a lot more um, energetic. But I think as most super clubs go, especially when you hold that kind of dominance, especially in the parties and the street parties, it does, send, it does tend to be a little bit more um, diluted than if Dortmund would have won. Just, just last for me, this so Terzic, right? If he he would be he was involved, I think, in helping Billich for Ireland Croatia back in twenty twelve. Then uh, yeah, he was involved with Billich, obviously. Uh, subsequently, how big a blow is this? Because like this could be your career defining sort of bottle of job. Yes and no. I think the personality of Terzic and some of the kind of. Uh, his tactical measures I think the big test of him this year has been tactical mm. uh, everyone knows that he has the emotion he kind of connects with um, Dortmund fans a lot more than some of the other coaches in the last few years he has that emotion and I think because he's won silverware with this Dortmund side the season before last um, it won't be such a stain on his career uh, I think people have to remember the first half of the season. They were sixth or fifth with uh, nine points behind Bayern. Uh, they had to make that up and they did. And they pushed really hard. You do not become a title winner with the first half of the season they had. The fact that they got close is really, really surprising. And that takes a hell of a job to do. Um, so I don't think it's going to be a huge stain on his um, career. I do think they'll be in a better place next season. I do also think it would be terrible if they try and change manager once again. Um, I think they've got a really good foundation in place now, which they haven't had for a while. I would say since Tuchel, but um, Tuchel and the board really didn't get along as we've heard so many times. So um, I think they were strongest since Tuchel now and they have a really good foundation to build on with Ed and Terzic. They were quite inconsistent as well in early parts of the season, Jasmine, and it felt like maybe that World Cup break was, was a bit of a turning point for, for Terzic. Oh, absolutely. Um, again, it wasn't only the kind of change of philosophy that they had to do in the first half of the season. There was quite a bit of upheaval with Erling Haaland leaving. You had Sebastian Haller. You had, um, obviously, Adeyemi and Marlon was already there. But 
really had to go into a new role. They all basically had to get into a new role. We had Nicholas Sula come in. So there was quite a big upheaval through club and philosophy at that time, which led to these inconsistencies. And then to make it worse, Sebastian Holler, someone that they were going to rely on, obviously, uh, quite tragically, had that cancer diagnosis that ruled him out, yeah. out for most of the season until the, the winter break and just after the winter break. So, yeah, that winter break gave them quite a lot. It gave them time to actually drill in Edin Terzic's philosophy. And, I mean, the run that they went on afterwards was just insane. So, um, yeah, you, a little bit of time, a little bit of up, upheaval. I mean, we might see another upheaval again, but I don't think... Hopefully it won't be that severe with because um, it does look like Bellingham is leaving uh, and Guerrero too. So I, I think most of that team is quite solid enough. They just need that one kind of number eight replacement to challenge once again. Uh, Bellingham you mentioned there had been struggling with an injury. I think he only came on at the weekend against uh, Mainz in that game. Um, I presume now that his leaving and probably to Real Madrid is is inevitable. There's there's no chance of him staying. Mm, and yeah, I don't believe so. So what happened over the weekend is just quite a few hints that he's leaving. So uh, I don't personally read into these things. I like to uh, read into it when it's actually announced because you don't know what's going to happen. But um, yeah, there's a report of him being the last one to leave the ground on the weekend apparently he had a meeting with um the board so Kim Vatska and uh Sebastian Kale uh, who's sporting director with his family so um yeah he apparently gave farewell gifts for everyone and was going around the stadium with his family which uh reporters over here think these are uh telltale signs that someone is leaving so um, there's reports that the deal with Real Madrid will be finalised in the next few days as well. So, yeah, I would say he's gone. He, uh, he earned the Player of the Season award as well, deservedly? I, I mean, yes and no. I think it's always hard to uh, single out an individual award for a team sport it doesn't sit right with you're me. not a fan of these awards um, no i think things that you can count so top scorer obviously makes sense because it, you have a quantifiable amount of things to say that you're better than someone else in that league but in terms of uh player of the year uh, yeah, you, you can base it on so many things. I think he's one, one of the best players in the league. That's uh, certain. I mean, his presence was missed on the final day. If he played, would have Dortmund would Dortmund win the title? Probably, but he has also been inconsistent at times too. So um, I, I can't say deservedly, but yeah, he is one of the best. I find it weird when. Normally, players of the season are given to the title-winning team. So I would also have to say Jamal Musiala has had a fantastic season and literally won the title for Bayern Munich. Um, and yeah, you can choose a best player from several teams. I mean, I'm not saying Jude Bellingham doesn't deserve it, though, because I know many people will get mad if I say that, and I'm not saying that at all. I just can't quantify um, what an individual award for player of the season means for each player yeah, for each uh, league yeah that's Musiala got the 89th minute winner as well to secure that title for, for Bayern as well at the weekend the um struck me as well Jasmine that like Bayern lead, lead the table four times during the season and each time that they take the lead they drop points like does that does that say something about their I don't want to say well I'm going to say it inferiority complex almost to Bayern Munich that every time they get to the top of the table they they drop points they bottle it essentially oh, you can read it into so many things you could try and I wouldn't like to say it's bottle or it's mentality I think those things and I've not really checked at what point they've switched over or what, which uh, mm. games that they've had when they've dropped points because um 
you don't know who's had the harder run in at that certain point. Um, did they face a, a harder team at the point Bayern had faced an easier team? All of those things. And if most of those changes took place in the second half of the season where Dortmund were on the, this incredible run anyway. So, um, yeah, it, it's hard to say if some, someone slips up, is it a bottle bottle job or is it just the, the how the fixtures are laid what are the injuries like mm. all of these things and then we've obviously had that really dramatic coaching change of buy-in which made everything else inconsistent too so yeah i wouldn't i don't like to put it on to mentality i think that's quite unfair um one thing i will say about how emotional it can be at times is the single uh, Dortmund Mines game there were there were pieces of that game where it did look like Dortmund were over sloppy so especially in defence for their second goal and and sometimes it's just unluckiness as well oh, no no sorry I'm going to stick with sloppiness because uh -huh. Valera's penalty um, I was going to say unlucky and then I replayed it in my head but it was not the greatest penalty now is that due to a penalty taker situation because I wouldn't have technically thought a Holaire would have taken that penalty. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think it's moments of sloppiness, but I think that's just what happens sometimes and it just came at the wrong time for Dortmund. What, what, what's the... Um What's the kind of vibe in German football at the moment, Jasmine? And Union Berlin season was mad, like, and there's so much to admire still in Germany about the club structures compared to, you know, petrol states effectively being allowed to take over in England. Yeah, and that's been a burning uh, discussion in Germany as well because we've recently had a vote uh, across the first two leagues, which are both uh, under the DFL. Um, if they want to have an investor for the league. So um, they voted against that. Uh, and, but it was it, it was only two thirds of the vote that you had to pass for it to be accepted and they didn't reach that margin. So this has been a burning debate and there's been lots of discussion. Fans don't want a league investor so it, even at a league level to maybe free up having an investor at club level um, is also a conversation going on here. Um, but yeah, I would say the clubs are mostly better run. Um, I mean, the, we do still have investor types in some manner of the way. So you just have to look on the other side of Berlin at Hertha, who got relegated a few weeks ago, um, how their investors... Uh, basically wanted to sell up the shares and have a new investor and they just don't have the money and now are facing um, quite a few problems with the li licensing for next season. So yeah, they're, they're mostly better run, but we're not perfect either. Mm -hmm. And we can't put the same kind of, uh, the same kind of money as Premier League clubs do. And that's why we are seen as weaker. Um, but many people in Germany, I mean, a lot of people in Germany do find it boring that Bayern Munich always win the title. However, there is still a sense of, well, if it's not my team winning, I don't really care who wins. Yeah. So you've, you, you've got both of that. It can be quite boring to look outside of it, but you have so many other storylines that people watch the German Bundesliga and the Spider Bundesliga, which is the second tier, it's about the culture, it's about the fan groups, it's about being with it with your own sets of fans and treating it more like a day out than whoever wins. And then you've always got relegation and um, Europe spots are always fight, like fought over every season. So um, the attitude was quite sad that someone else didn't win. But I think it's quite um, superficial at, at, to an extent. A mm, little bit of indifference there, no doubt. Um, finally, and very briefly, um, Jasmine, the Brighton, we kind of keep a, a heavy eye on, on Brighton on these shores at the moment, given Evan Ferguson's involvement. But they've signed uh, Mahmoud Dahoud, um, 
couple of German caps to his name free transfer from Borussia Dortmund uh, of course they'll have Saicedo and, and McAllister uh, heading out the, the other direction Brighton and, and lots of games in the Europa League to look forward to next season so need for a big squad what sort of player are Brighton getting? You're getting a fantastic player. Um, they're getting a fantastic player, I and mean, he's a more deep lying playmaker. So he likes to. He's best in just sitting in front of uh, the back line. He's very technically gifted. He creates really good passing options for different players. Um, really good sense of where to position himself. So he's rarely caught lacking on the pitch and he's clever in terms of when to press a player which has become increasingly important in the Premier League. He suits a more possession dominant um, team so Brighton should be quite good for him. Um, the only things that I would that has kind of had a few warning signs over him is that his um, injury record he t does tend to get injured and sometimes is not the strongest physically so he can get be and pushed around a little more often than not but I really like Modahood. Um I think he was one of the stronger pivot players in the last two seasons despite his injuries and he's got a lovely mid-range shot to him so if you just have him outside the area um, I really hope he has a, a crack at goal because he has scored some really fantastic goals over the years Brilliant Look forward to seeing him in the Premier League in action next season with Brighton Jasmine great stuff as always thanks a million Great, thank you Brilliant Jasmine Baba the football analyst there at 49am on this Tuesday morning so 8pm Carl Milani joins us in studio Carl, what's happening? Hi lads, how's it going? All well? Keeping well, keeping well. It's uh, we, were, we were having a brief chat earlier about the, the state of Gaelic football. Are you enjoying Gaelic football at the moment? Um, we're talking about the backwards, yeah. the, the Ross Common possession moment at the weekend. Yeah, like, there's two sides to it, I guess. Um, you got to give teams credit that they're capable of doing that as well, and that you know Roscommon kept the ball for that period of time and that's what the focus is on and that takes skill in itself but yeah. from a spectator point of view it probably isn't great to watch at the moment um, I think the, the the fact that there's a little bit of teams know that they'll probably get through the groups I think Dublin or Scum know that they'll get through the group that they're in uh, which maybe removes some of the cut and thrust that's there in the in the group stage of the All-Ireland Championship I think a pretty easy fix would be two teams to get out of the group rather than three from mm. next year but we'll see when everything finishes up at the end of it um, but it's probably another thing as well is the the quality of the hurling that we've seen over the last number of weeks <coughs> has has um, shown football to be a lot less dull, really, uh, when you consider the fair in Munster and, and even Leinster last weekend in the hurling that it, it it just had so much more drama, so many more scores. Not more dull, you mean? Sorry, the football looks worse. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think as as things progress, you know, the football will, will definitely heat up. And again, you you know people criticise teams and, and criticise counties for the fair that's on show in football at the moment but if it's a case of trying to keep the ball and stuff like that I mean what do we want do we want teams to go out and give the ball away David Burke uh, is football obsessed right and if he were to play man on man and a shootout against Dublin you know they should really lose 19 times out of 20 maybe mm. he's, he's devised a way to make inferior teams a lot closer they beat Mayo and Castle Bar and they drew against Dublin like these are seismic results it just doesn't make it any more watchable mm. yeah um, he's doing a brilliant job yeah absolutely is, brilliant yeah. job and Roscommon have turned into a properly competitive mm. Of Division One team, they're dangerous. Yeah. They're very dangerous, mm. and I think Roscommon will fancy themselves to maybe get to an All Ireland semi final this year. I think they'll feel that they're that's the sort of company that they can mm. keep now, um, and that's a big result for them against Dublin and Crow Park. And I think it's been a while since Roscommon won in Crow Park, so they'll probably be disappointed they didn't get over the line. But um, that's. Davy Burke's job that's the manager's job is to, to turn these teams into competitive teams uh, you know in whatever style that they play or methods that they employ they've got to do it I guess to try and get results because it's a cutthroat business at inter-county management level you've got to get results and you know I guess Mayo maybe are one of the other teams that have gone the other direction that they're playing with a, a bit more of a kicking game this year a lot of flair a lot of athleticism Galway as well and I actually think that the last two weeks have shown that Dublin and Kerry 
Kerry maybe aren't as ahead of the pack or even yeah. if they are ahead where, of the where pack was, where were Dublin considered like Dublin were far short from the bet in the Galway all along well, what's this based on people expected them to, to start peeking around now but it just yeah, hasn't they, kicked even in, in. The, even in the league they were they were far from coming yeah. well Desi Farr made the point the weekend that the, you know the Division 2 campaign probably didn't stand to them a lot of these yeah. teams are playing our Division 1 outfits and that campaign probably yeah. helps and that's a tricky game for them against Kildare in Nolan Park because mm. Kildare will absolutely not fear that now I know Kildare weren't overly impressive against Sligo uh, but they did run Dublin close in Crow Park and in, in the league and in the championship um, I actually think that, that Galway and Mayo are right up there now with, with Mayo and Kerry based on the last couple of weeks but, but like it was, the, the, the three Connacht teams were first, second and third in the league yeah. the league is, is the league is a real barometer these days I just didn't get why like I was at the league final this is a serious standard of football and you're going back and they're third and fourth favourites for the All-Ireland I'm I like, that's a little bit odd mm. we, we lost to Kerry last year <laughs> with a conscientious decision and like you know we, 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 were, we were improving Dublin I just didn't I haven't seen Dublin play that well for a long time mm. so I, it, it seemed to be weird to me but Dublin this narrative that all oh, Dublin are building it, it just it's not bearing fruit it's yeah. wide open it's definitely wide rather the go we're a little bit in the dark um, I just I, I just found it a bit odd like that we were like 7 or 8 to 1 to win the All-Ireland Mayo were like 10 to 1 it was like no respect anymore Johnny there's no respect who's watching like Con- Connacht is is a very strong sound of football at the moment yeah um, and it's like yeah I don't know no, we'll see we'll see by the end of the season for sure um, any other bits happening this morning Colin? Well, the Irish training squad for the Rugby World Cup set to be named today by Andy Farrell over 40 players will be included before that squad is trimmed down later in the summer ahead of the tournament which begins in September in uh, football the semi-finals take place at the under 17 European Championships the Republic of Ireland knocked out by Spain at the weekend they play France tonight and before that Poland uh, take on Germany there's racing today as well at Ballinrobe and Tipperary as well and we're also expecting the venue for the Munster hurling final between Clare and Limerick uh, to be confirmed today confirmation was expected for that venue last night but it's now been pushed back to today and in terms of the action at the French Open tennis today uh, Daniel Medvedev among those in action in the men's singles while the women's top seed and defending champion Iga Svantec opens her campaign against Christina Buxa Carl great stuff as always thanks a million for thanks, popping in Carl Milani there with us at uh, 8.54am in this Tuesday morning's OTBM uh, now, besides Stephen uh, Roach's Giro win back in 1987, no other Irish rider had finished higher than 10th at that race uh, until, of course, the weekend just gone. So Eddie Dunbar taking one of the best ever general classification results by an Irish uh, cyclist at the Giro, finishing 7th overall, was as high as 4th as well at one point. Delighted to say Eddie Dunbar joins us on the line now this morning. Eddie, how are things? Not too bad, how are you? Keeping well, keeping well. Are you wrecked? Um, I'm actually not too bad, funny enough, but... Um yeah, it's uh, the strangest thing is just like for three weeks you're just obviously going around Italy and uh, you're just kind of in a routine and then all of a sudden you wake up and uh, yeah, it's just back to normal life really. But um, yeah, you're, you're just so zoned out for three weeks. Um, it, I'd say it takes like a couple of days to properly kick in before you realise, all right, I've done a three-week race there the last, the last while, you know. Because you wouldn't have a, a, a huge amount of Grand Tour experience, but when, when I say that, that, that you know, besides that win for Roach in '87, no other Irish cyclist had gotten it into a top ten. I mean, it's quite an incredible achievement, and you had called it before before the Giro as well. You wanted a top ten finish. Yeah, so like it was always the plan that I do the Giro this year, and um, in fe- first of February, first race for the new team, and uh, I broke my hand, so um, that kind of put a hamper on the preparations a bit, and yeah, basically. Yeah, there was a point where I thought, all right, I'm not even going to make it to the Giro. Um, I was in the cast for four weeks. Um, the bone didn't heal. Then I um, had to go see a hand surgeon in Manchester and then I had to get an operation on my hand to get a bone removed. And uh, there was just a massive whole rigmarole there. And um, yeah, but with the team and everything, we worked out a good plan. And yeah, we got to, we got to May. Um, in relatively good condition considering everything and uh, yeah it was just about going in seeing how it went and uh, thankfully it went pretty smoothly really and um, yeah I learned a lot but a lot I can improve on as well which is massive positive after three weeks of racing you know I had to I had to laugh that Eddie when you were saying there's a lot I can improve on I was watching back last night I was at a couple of the stages uh, recorded and one of the ridiculously tough mountain stages where I don't know if they had four category one climbs but you you were in a little group of three Roglic was in front of you and I was like what is going through your head here where you're like I think you were fifth or sixth at the time in the in the standings and um, you 
were calling your own an incredibly tough stage like staying in the saddle I was looking at you I was like what has gone through this man's head and to still think you can improve and do better than this yeah I think it was just more so like as you said at the start this is I don't have much Grand Tour experience um, it's only my second Grand Tour the last one was four years ago so like um normally when you're 26 years of age you have four or five these races in the bank and um like compared to a lot of guys my age i don't have that experience and um yeah so to be in that company um already in my second grand tour i think that's a massive positive um but like even in terms of like being in that race situation against the best guys in the world um you know, they, them boys have been doing it for the last 10 years. Um, so as I said, I've been catching up to do, but it was, um, yeah, at the time you don't, you don't um, actually take it all in, you know. Um, obviously Roglic, Garen Thomas, Almeida, these three boys, they've been fairly dominant the last few years winning bike races. So to be in that company was, it was fairly special looking back at it now. But at the time I was like, all right, I can, I want to stay here and I want to beat these guys, you know. How do you, um, how do you that, climb better? Um, just exposure to racing basically yeah um, I suppose you could go into the detail of it like with your race weight stuff like that um, going into the race but at the same time it's literally exposure to, to the, like racing on them long climbs um, like the Grand Tours and the main races where you have 20k climbs where you're going uphill for an hour like the week long stage races you might have one or two stage races where you're um yeah, you'd have a you'd have one long climb thrown in, but it's the Grand Tours where the longest climbs are yet. So like that's where you can um, really improve going up there and race at race rhythm, race pace, and um, yeah, there's only so much you can do in training. But it's just that exposure to racing and being able to push yourself, um, yeah, against the best guys. You know, I mean, you you could go out training and do a twenty k climb and go pretty fast up there, but. Um, you're, you're, you've nothing to gauge yourself off you know as I said you have these guys like Garen Thomas and Roglic the, some of the best climbers in the world you know so the, the real test is to see how far they are ahead of you and try and make up that time you know the, the, this is a, like this is probably a stupid question but do you talk at all on these climbs like because when it's like I, I don't know if there's a more agonising thing physically in, in the entire existence of sport than climbing um, maybe in hot weather in the Tour de France or whatever but like do you confer at all about like the pace that's going on here obviously you're different teams like how does it work yeah so basically for instance that day, I think it was stage 16 um, that day when there was me Roglic Almeja mm. G um, and Zana we had Zana in the breakaway the Italian mm. champion and he dropped back um, so for instance he he was already up the road he was four minutes ahead but he stayed back because he knew I was coming across in the group with the other guys so um, we have radios while we race so we can communicate back to our mm. DS's director sportive um, back in the car and uh, I, like all the riders on the team so there's seven or eight of us they can all hear what we say on the radio and um, so literally it's a little we press a piece here we talk into it like that um, and we can communicate fairly well so it's a case of yeah, I was feeling good that day, so I told Zana, got on the radio, told him to go to the front. Um, a few times he went a bit too hard. I let him know that fairly quick, <laughs> not on the radio, but um, I, I shouted. Uh, yeah, but as I said, that's you just kind of go off feel really. But there is there is a lot of talking, like amongst other guys and stuff, other teams, um, and it's like yes, it's like a game of chess on wheels sometimes, you know. It's funny because it's the same when you talk to jockeys about the, you know during a big race you, you don't realise that they are, some of them are having full blown mm. conversations obviously about things pertinent to the race but it's a, it's, it's a fascinating one when you look at it as well Eddie like you're only what, what, seven and a half minutes behind Primoz Roglic at the end that's after over th you know over three weeks three thousand four hundred and forty eight kilometers the gap's not huge at all no um, and I think I, a lot of that time. Um, I lost was in time trials as well I'd mm. say four minutes of that was in individual time trials of um, which isn't that's that's another area that I can um, massively improve on um, we've done a lot of work on the TT bike um, in the off season with going to wind tunnels stuff like that um, but yeah that's the whole process just trying to dial in um, like on the day um, switching from like racing 200k to in an individual effort of 20 30k um, it's just a whole different kind of ball game you know um, but as I said that's that's an area I can really improve that's where I lost most of my time and uh, yeah that's that's certainly something to look at because in terms of like climbing I think yeah as I said I was up there with um, 
the best riders in the race in terms of climbing. So that was a massive positive. Do, does then, that like uh, do, does it? Do you have to blink uh, and think like when you say that? Like you just say it so nonchalantly. Like you were up there with the best climbers in the world in the Giro. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. But as I said, it's just uh, all I like. I just want an opportunity in these races. Um, I've kind of as I said, there's a, like there's only so much you can gauge in training and. Um, Obviously, I work closely with um, the team coach and everything, and uh, we know we know like the ability. I can go up a hill in training. That's not um, that's not an issue. But as I said, it's just trying to replicate replicate that in a race. And uh, as I said, I think um, the amount we learned like this last three weeks in terms of that is is massive. And as I said, once once we dial in on the the final <coughs> details, I think um, yeah, as I said, that, hopefully we can get that gap a bit smaller. But um, yeah, like that last that last two days uh, I think it was stage 19 stage 20 that was the days I lost a bit of time as well but um, yeah it was stage 19 I woke up and uh, my chest was at me I was after picking up something but I'd say half the peloton went through some sort mm. of illness um, in the three weeks because we, we got soaked to the skin 14 days in a row you know so it was bound to our immune systems were down racing five six hours a day so it's just like there was something bound to kick in i was just hoping it'd kick in um this week when i was off the bike as opposed to the two hardest days in the race but again that's that's no excuse it's um yeah it's part of a grand tour trying to figure out how to get through it as healthy as possible and uh yeah avoiding all kinds of trouble like crashes and all that which we did very well um so as i said it's all in all it was it was a it was a positive positive three weeks and um yeah, as I said, just that last two days, I was fairly disappointed in myself, but it was, uh, yeah, looking back on it, it, it wasn't so bad, I guess. What, what was the take, and can you explain this to people who wouldn't, most people listening wouldn't, won't be aware of this, what was the take on Roglic's gear set for, was it the, <laughs> the, 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 the really pivotal stage where he'd like, was it like a 42 at the back or something like that? It was like mad looking. Oh, it was crazy, yeah, because it was the day before as well, for the last um, steep climb. I don't know, we'd one long, shorter, kind of, was it 4K, and then we'd 3K uphill, but he changed his bike at the bottom of the climb, um, and we were all, like, we were all, like, chatting, like, fuck, what happened, like, what happened there, you know? <laughs> we thought he punctured, but uh, he came back with a one, just a single chain ring bike, and, um, and I'd say it was just a pure, like, test to see how it would go for the day after. That was my my take on it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, as I said, that's, that's what it comes down to now um, in cycling, like, games like that I think um, like that last TT it was it was like 4 or 5k at 15 16% average like <laughs> not for I think it was average so it's just like you you had to get the bike light as possible and you had to get your pacing right um, so like li- little things like that take your chain ring off your bike it might only save uh, I don't know 50 60 grams but like that could be that could be a second or two on that gradient you know which is, is pretty mad when you think about it um, but yeah as I said he that last TT was super impressive from him uh, um, he said he's from Slovenia and um, I think it was that TT's 10k from the Slovenian border so there was a, a sea of Slovenian flags going up the climb um, but but yeah, as I said, that was fairly impressive by him because um, G had a had a everyone I'd say thought like G had the pink sewn up. I certainly did anyway, and uh, yeah, so yeah, chapeau to Roglic. He had a I'd say it was probably his best day ever on a bike. You know, you talk about avoiding the crashes there as well, Eddie, and, and there was even a close uh, close enough call in the last hundred meters of the final stage as well. But uh, that that um, June 2017 accident that you had where you go over the handlebars and it's a severe concussion five months essentially off the bike um, I think I remember you talking at one point as well that you were maybe a couple of weeks away from, from quitting the sport essentially um, what what was that experience like because that, that, that was a, a horrific crash to go through yeah because the funny like it's not funny I guess but the, the thing about that crash was there was like I didn't have any cuts or um, like I did the usual like bruises or whatever from hitting the deck hard but um, yeah like that thing I, I didn't have much um, knowledge on concussion at the time um, it wasn't a thing in cycling we wear helmets I guess people think oh if you have a helmet you're, you're protected um, so yeah I, I went through a really bad phase being honest um, like I can't I can remember my head going towards the floor after the accident is a fairly um, fairly blurry experience you could say Um and yeah it was I didn't know what was wrong I knew there was something wrong and 
like it was a few days after I took three days off the bike and the nationals were coming up and um, like I, I constant pain in my head you know um, I couldn't stand a bright light I couldn't stand like music couldn't watch TV I couldn't train I couldn't concentrate um, but like as I said I couldn't I couldn't see anything physically wrong with myself so it was very hard to um it was, it was hard to see I was like I don't know what's wrong you know um, obviously I was fairly young as well so I was like I didn't didn't even think of um, yeah the effects of concussion or anything like that and I just remember going out training one day after the crash and I was with one of my friends Dara O'Mahony and uh, I was going along the road and I, anytime I hit a bump I just it's like the pain in my head was unbelievable and I said it to him and he was just like yeah that's, that's not good you know um, and then I said, like, I told him, well, come on, we'll do an effort here. I want to see if my head hurts or whatever. And uh, I was, he was just like, no, no, you don't need to do that. I was like, no, I have to see what's wrong. And uh, I start, we start to do this effort. And the first thing he said to me was like, he's like, if anything happens to you, no, this isn't my fault. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> Graham. But like, we started to do this effort and the pain in my head after, I was just like, right, there's, there's something wrong. But I continued training, um, went to race, but I got progressively worse. My personality completely changed. Um, yeah I was probably crying once or twice a day I'm not a big crier um, but yeah that's completely emotional wreck I was um, I was sleeping for three or four hours a night um, yeah that didn't help then obviously that leads to other things anxiety um, panic attacks stuff like that um, and it was just like a roller coaster of um, yeah emotion really uh, didn't stopped training didn't didn't race for like eight months and it wasn't until the follow that happened in june or july 2017 and it wasn't until the following december um i did my first ever scat test which is i think it's fairly mandatory in most sports now to do this scat test and uh, i remember um the team doctor he did it with me and i I got the first three questions wrong in the scat test and this was um this was six months after the crash and he he just turned around to me and he said have you been he said have you been properly assessed since your crash and i said no i i haven't you know um so then he got the ball rolling on that i went to see a guy in dublin and um it was only at that point the guy in dublin um, I was with him for two hours, did all the tests, and uh, he just said, "Yeah, he said you were you were severely concussed. You know, um, it's no it's no wonder you're feeling like this." Um, so as I said, then that's when we it was it was clear that there was there was an underlying issue. Uh, but as I said, it was a very slow process. Then um, I was very that it was January that year. I was very close to calling it a day in the bike. Completely couldn't couldn't concentrate. Lost the love for cycling. Um, and everything and that took you know that took a while to build back up which was strange um and yeah it was just a strange feeling you do, you do something for so long and then all of a sudden um yeah something like that and they said it was something you couldn't see so that was really frustrating and uh i just thought right yeah this is it this is i, I can't do this anymore because the mental impact it was having on me but um i got I, in the end i got the help i needed went to see the right people talked to the right people and um yeah, as I said, it was a slow build up, but um, yeah, it was a that was probably one of the biggest biggest learning experiences I'd say of my life, really. Yeah, that that whole eight to nine months. It's mad stuff. Like it's brilliant to hear that. And um, like, and I know Imogen Cotter has done stuff about her crash, like recently, and um, different crash and all that. I, I do wonder with cyclists, right? If you look at say if you, what Sam Bennett did in the tour when he was when he got the green jersey, and that year um, in the personality vote, he loses out to Katie Taylor. I had a real issue with that. I was like, so you're telling me the, the the best sprinter in cycling is inferior to somebody in boxing, in female boxing. You know, it's such a small pool. Do you, do you feel that cycling in Ireland, we have Ben Healy now coming up, we have yourself, we still have obviously Sam Bennett on the go, we've come through having some good cyclists. Do you, do you feel that we have potential here for people to actually realise how good our cyclists can be and the difficulty of the sport as well and get more people into it? Yeah, um, yeah, I think yeah, like that that time. Um, I'm, of course, I'm going to be biased, but I I I thought it was fairly. Um, for me, it was obvious that Sam should have won the um, the sports personality that year, um, and that's taking absolutely nothing away from the other people, but just being a being a cyclist and uh, knowing how hard that what Sam achieved 
um, how hard that would have been was absolutely incredible um, and especially in that year as well like the level that year you always hear it in 2020 because no one knew when we were going to race next there was guys needing contracts so like the level went up absolutely crazy high because guys were like Genie, I need a job next year you know like I don't know when we're going to race next and um, no one knew what was happening so like everyone was just racing like every day was their last race um, and that year Sam yeah he's, and he still is one of the best sprinters in the world he's one of the fastest man on two wheels and uh, um, it's yeah, it's, it's incredible actually what, what he does um, and how he does it in, in that, like how fast they go on them sprints, how much they risk their lives and it's unbelievable, genuinely. But uh, yeah, I think, like I'm, I'm good mates with Sam and we always talk about how um, it's really important to us cycling in Ireland. We grew up there from we were about, you know, 11, 12 cycling there in our clubs and it's really, it's something we're passionate about and um, as we always say, like if it's something if something like that even gets two or three lads or girls to take up the bike um, yeah that's that's what we want you know um, it's funny you've seen like Annalise don't. Murphy what she's the times like that she's doing and it's like well Annalise is an incredible sportswoman but like I, I'm always of the opinion like throw kids at everything that they can seeing as a young Corkery from your own neck of the woods winning the Ross as well like there's something there's something cool about getting involved young yeah, and I think like you've other like other disciplines of cycling as well that are coming into it. Um, like cyclocross is very popular now in Ireland. It's a winter, technically a winter sport where um, you can go and you, ra- you literally like cross country, but on a bike. You know, you race around the field, and I think that's a lot more appealing maybe for um, for parents. Um, as well having their kids do something like that because if they there's no um, there's no safety hazard there at all you know Um, obviously cycling on the road is pretty dangerous now um, and I can understand why parents would probably have an issue with that um, letting their kids go out on the road and unless they were supported um, that's absolutely fair but like the cyclocross thing is a great thing like you it's fun it's social it's a good like um, it's a good day out at the weekend for all families you know Um, and they do all ages from I think it's like five up to senior so it's like um, yeah you, they can go there it's it's great way to learn skills um, and then as the older they get you can kind of progress them out onto the road but that's like discipline like that is a great absolutely yeah brilliant way to get on the bike you know and it's insane as well just to think of, of the, I was actually watching the, the Ross Talton pass through Monaghan recently and to see Dylan Corkery go on and win it from that final leg from Monaghan to, to Black Rock I know uh, you're both Bantier men as well I think so there's something in the water clearly down there so cycling is uh, is a hot pot of that area do you know what I love it about Eddie he said after last week he said my ambition is to win the Tour de France right mm-hmm. and people uh, like it's an out, almost like an outlier in Ireland to be that's my ambition and whether you like it or not I think it's reasonable so yeah and and you were saying there a minute ago, Eddie, when you're talking about your concussion story. Like I remember the video, the mad video of uh, the, I'm going to butcher his pronunciation, the Latvian cyclist Tom Skuyans who uh, uh, falls off his bike in the Tour of California in 2017, the same yeah. year you had your crash, and it's terrifying because he gets up off the bike and essentially starts staggering between these cyclists coming downhill at ridiculous pace. He, he's almost killed, um, and he's clearly severely concussed. Same, same as yourself. You said you fell out of love with the sport. How did you fall back in, back in love with the sport? Did it take time? Yeah, it took a lot of time. Um, like that whole year, um, that was the year I was. I joined Aka Blue. That was the first Irish professional team. I was there, and uh, yeah, basically, I just had to build up slowly. I wasn't. I I didn't train properly until like March that year, um, and then slowly but surely, I just went race to race, um, and just built up like. Uh, yeah, there was no pressure or anything and then I just slowly start to enjoy it again um, start to train well um, and just kind of got back into a rhythm um, and there were still bits and pieces I was suffering from the concussion as I said like there's there's still some things now that I have um, from it but as I said you just kind of accept that and get on with it but uh, yeah at that time it was just like was getting through getting through the year and I got through it fairly well and I actually started to feel good on the bike I got a few results that built my confidence um more so to say right I actually haven't too much training done and I can still still compete here so that's um that kind of this game spurred me on a bit to think all right no there is still something there I'd be I'd be stupid not to um, pursue it you know Mm. um so as I said thankfully it, it all worked out in the end 
Well, listen, Eddie, fascinating stuff. Um, we'll be continuing to follow your, your story very closely. No doubt you'll be challenging on podiums, uh, grand tours, uh, consistently now going forward, we'd imagine. Uh, really, really good, good good stuff over the last number of weeks and uh, delighted to, to to have you happen on this morning. So fair play, Eddie. Well done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think, Eddie, as well, the, the next time I'm cycling up to the Mount Leinster Mast, I'll think, how would Eddie Dunbar do it? <laughs> You'll be thinking about Eddie and yeah. the Dolomites. And it'd be, uh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Eddie, great stuff. You'll be changed by. Cheers. Thanks, lad. <laughs> Thanks a million. Eddie Dunbar there. Fascinating athlete. Just like... like Honestly, uh, we don't have time here, but what these lads are doing is unbelievable. Like yeah. the, the the pain, the torture, and for Eddie to be at that level w- with so much to come is insane. And like mm. it's it's um, I know cycling is a peripheral sport in Ireland, but like we have a great history, and um, it's insane what he achieved last week. His mindset, and even the likes of Ben Healy challenging as well, and mm. you know it's just incredible stuff what they're doing. So uh, you'd imagine the sport is only going to go on an upward curve with with those lads challenging at big uh, big events. Uh, I should mention nine seventeen a.m. on this. Uh, Tuesday mornings OTBM don't miss all the action in Rugby Daily today on your OTB podcast network bringing you everything you need to know about rugby all in partnership with Deliveroo Deliveroo has some great bundles and deals so open the app make your choice and watch your rider come to you Deliveroo food we get it here are some highlights on the OTB podcast network today the football pod you have Monday Night Rugby and the latest Koi Gig pod as well you can follow OTB across all socials and subscribe to the OTB podcast network after the ads we'll be joined by the Irish athletics legend Dervil Rook. You're listening to OTB AM. Whether you're a Drive to Survive fan or Grand Prix expert, now you can stay up to date with the world of F1. The F1 pod on Off the Ball with Chicago Town Pizza, the ultimate podcast for F1 fans. The F1 pod will keep you on the edge of your seat. For the best insight and analysis, subscribe to the Off the Ball daily podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Coming soon, the F1 pod on Off the Ball with Chicago Town Pizza. Formula One? Yeah, we go to town on it. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Yeah, 18 minutes past nine on this uh, Tuesday morning's OTB AM. That conversation with Eddie Dunbar has got me in the mood for talking about a bit more exercise as well with the sun shining for the foreseeable future. It's the perfect opportunity to get out and get active and Grant Thornton Ireland is encouraging you to do just that with the return of its GT 5K race series this summer. The Irish Olympian Dervil O'Rourke is back as the national race ambassador with the first race of the series kicking off in her native Cork on June the 13th. Dervil, how are things? Good morning. Things are great. How are you? Keeping well, keeping well. We're flying it here. Um, it's funny. I was reading the. Uh, well, we had a conversation over the last week or two. We were talking about the the GEA conversation about the under twelves and the competition, and it kind of blew up on on Twitter as this thing. You know, should should we have competition for under twelves, and and should this be a thing? You wrote a you wrote a piece actually in the Examiner. I think in the last month or two, we were talking about this. Where you, you've you've two kids yourself of that age now, where they're getting involved in sport. What what's your take on all this? and, and um, I guess finding the right balance between competition and and enjoyment really first of all you have, I'm sorry about my dog she's a bit elderly <laughs> and she gets out a bit um, clearly she's got really big views on this <laughs> I find it I find it fascinating right I find it fascinating from so many angles because obviously I come from the elite end of sport where I was that kid that I was winning from when I was young like so for me, sport always felt, it gave me a lot. It felt very easy, particularly as that kid that was winning. And now I see, like, I'm in, I have two, I have a four-year-old, I have a seven, almost eight-year-old. But the other thing I've started doing is, in the past two years, I've started coaching a lot more, like just voluntary coaching. And I've coached from every level, from like the high performance level of an athlete, you know, going to major champs, to, down to a six-year-old in my local school. Um, so for me, I think there needs to be such a balance. Like, I I think, and I guess I feel quite passionate about girls as well. Like, I think girls need to feel like they have a place in sport and that it feels like easy and doable for them to move. And I think that can start to feel really difficult really quickly. And I see the competitive side of it, like with, you know, even my daughter, like she she wants, she wants the crack um, and she doesn't want to be bored, but the competitive side of it isn't a big thing for her. And you know, obviously, like in my house, like my husband went to the Olympics as well. We're obviously quite competitive people. So I think it's massively important that we come at this. For me, success is that your kids are still moving in 10 years. It's not that your kids are necessarily trying to go to the Olympics because that's such a tiny part of sport. Um, 
so yeah I do feel very passionate about it sorry that was a bit of a long ramble no no it's fascinating because you obviously have that experience of, of being a competitive professional athlete as someone who was involved in sport yourself growing up and then to have kids as well coming into it where you're I guess you're trying to find that balance and, and you see so many parents and, and Jer spoke about it yesterday you see parents at, at the side, sidelines of underage soccer matches or Gaelic matches in this country who are essentially trying to live out their their broken sporting dreams through their kids which is which is terrible really yeah it's interesting to me I think I've probably learned more from coaching actually than not that I haven't learned from the kids the kids would be very insulted mm-hmm. um I, I think when you coach, actually, you see, and I think it would be good, actually, for every every adult. I'm going to let the dog out. He's going to drive me No worries. <laughs> you apologize. It's a full time job. Here. It's busy. The dogs keep you busy as well, John. Do you, have a dog, do you have a dog yourself? Uh, not at the moment. No, um, big big time for dogs. But um, you're not a cat yeah, man. Um, cat, cats are. I don't I'd have to the, kick you out of studio if you're a cat, cat man. Ca- the, the, the way that cats say, play with mice is not dog. a fan. Yeah. Hop in there. Yeah, oh, you're back. Yeah. Yeah. You're a dog. I'm back, I'm back. The dog thing's um, somewhat relevant because Berlino is the name of the mascot at the 2009 Olympic or 2009 World Championships because my then boyfriend had a bet with me that I couldn't make a world final. And that if I did, that he would get me a dog. And she is that dog from 2009. Wow. There's a nice legacy there of the then boyfriend. <laughs> then boy, but now husband. So, you know, it's, it all worked out well. Anyway, sorry, back to... Uh, back I have to, to ask you about the name of Archie later on as well, because I know that's significant, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah, you can ask me about that. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, sorry, from, from a coaching perspective. So for me, as I said, like in the past, when I first retired... I didn't really coach at all, right? I was really busy with life, starting to have babies, starting my business, you know, doing doing different things. And in the past two years, I've definitely gone more into that mode of like giving back because I've kind of come full circle. I feel like I've had enough distance from, I've had enough distance from the sport to actually, to actually feel like I can go at it maybe from a, a more, a more maybe relaxed perspective with less bias of my own experience and less of that high performance mindset maybe in some ways it's good and in some ways you need to park it but I think I think anybody who anybody who has a child should be involved in volunteer coaching is actually something I think um, and for me it's taught me a huge amount because I know I, like as I said at the moment I'm, I'm coaching a group of girls at the moment right yeah. and the fact that some of them are running in the court city sports on Thursday, I don't know if that's something you you guys have heard of. It's like a sprint event in Cork. It happens every year. Every Pretty much every school in Cork takes part in it. 60 metres, 80 metres, 100 metres. It's amazing, right? Happens for boys and girls. So I'm coaching the girls that are doing that. But when I started coaching those girls, I had this, this moment where I was like, like, my daughter is not one of the girls who made that team. And I was like, I shouldn't just be there coaching the really fast girls it's just as important as the girls who aren't fast that they get a little bit of exposure to maybe someone they might know from something you know they might know me from fitness family or they might know me from my athletics career or something else so and i have had i swear i'm not just saying it just as much enjoyment from coaching the girls that look nervous and apprehensive and you know they don't want to move mm. to the girls who are actually going and trying to do really well on thursday in that big meet so i think as as a person you have to stand back and go what's this all about like it's about people feeling good about themselves and you have to park that <coughs> metal side if that makes sense it must be it must be a strange one for parents well I remember when I was a kid I always used to marvel at like there were parents who um, on one level would be at every game and would shout um you know, cheer on their kids almost at the expense of everyone else, which I wasn't a big fan of. Then there are parents who literally never went to see their son play. Never. They'd never be at a game from first game in the league to the county championship. Never went to games. And I always wondered why that was the case. But nowadays, you've obviously parents as well. And I see this in my own family that, you know, they've so much to do to and from bringing them here and there. And you're like, what is the balance of all this? <laughs> Yeah, the, bal- the balance is an interesting one as well. Like, for, so for me, just with my kids, um, I like my son is quite young. Like, he's he's only four, so like he does a bit of gymnastics once a week, and I mean, I'd say a bit of gymnastics. That's very loose because I don't know. Does he actually listen and do anything? He just runs around and has the crack. Um, but my daughter then my daughter's in much more. So my my thing, I guess, with my kids is again, it's back to the individual kid. Like, I know what my daughter like. She 
she responds really well to moving her body. She feels really good if she moves. So I aim to go, okay, is there something, is there something she can do most days that help her, helps her to move? But then the other thing I do is I kind of judge it. It's almost like, I hate using this word that makes it sound really formal. It's almost like doing an audit, like every few months, like for your, because most, most of us as parents are working and trying to balance everything. So it's like, can you sit down every three to six months and go, okay, what's the balance here? Like what's tipping us over the edge? Like what? What's the reality? What do, what are they getting out of this sport? Are they enjoying it? Are they miserable? Like, is there something else you can slot in, take out? And like, yes, like as I said, my daughter does loads of stuff. But last night I spent probably an hour outside of her where we did a combination of like messing around with the basketball. She made me go into the trampoline with her for ages. Um, and just lots of just very informal exercise. And that's the thing as well. I think we get very caught up in like you know, be, being able to, and I, and I hear it, I hear it in other parents, I hear it when I coach of someone wants to be able to kind of label, oh, my kid's really fast at this, or, you know, such and such a kid is great at doing that, as opposed to saying like, like some days I walk my daughter to school, right? And I'm lucky in that I can make that work with my own work. Um, and I live close enough to the school to do that. But for me, that's a massive success that like I can get up, and I, she, the two of us can walk to school together, chat, like, that's really good exercise. So, uh, you know, I think people get caught up in, yes, I, I do think they get caught up in the competitive side. And I'm sitting here now as someone like, who went to Olympics as the most competitive kid <laughs> in the world. I wanted to, I was challenging every kid that I grew up with to race, but not every kid is like that. And in fact, most kids probably aren't like that. So I think it's really important to make those kids feel empowered to move their bodies because that's the tool for life really really important it's funny because I was, I was actually reading an interview uh, brings us nicely to, to Rashida Adelecki because I was reading an interview with her and she was talking about her earliest sporting memory being I think it was, she was in primary school and winning a, a 50 metre sprint race and you know her teachers or whatever saying you're you're fast um, and obviously it, it taken off from there um, I mean, and Derv- she logs. And she, she, <laughs> literally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the records that just keep come tumbling down, and again at the weekend, Derville, at the numbers just, um, you know, a sub fifty second display again. Personal best time of forty nine point five four over four hundred meters. I mean, Rashida is just unbelievable, isn't she? Yeah, she's other level. She's other level. Like, you know, I suppose myself and say the other the other athletes that are out the other side of our career i guess the athletes that have a bit of profile that come on and we talk about athletes we're always really careful when we're talking to like bring down expectation because it's a really hard thing to carry and when we see you know young underage athletes being prodigies and doing really well at like world under 20s european under 20s breaking records we're always like okay calm it down let's not put the pressure on because that transition from being a 19 year old to being a really good 20 something in the senior level is so difficult but I genuinely believe Rashid is very different to that um, she's actually at that level now globally like she she and I said this to Rob Heffernan last summer I said you know what Rashida Rashida will have a crack off the podium in Budapest and she'll have an even bigger crack off the podium in Paris like she is coming for everything in the sport and like you just love to see it because I don't honestly believe we've ever had a talent like her and I say that with saying you know I think Sonia Sullivan Queen I think she's unbelievable but I think Rashida will go places maybe even Sonia didn't and that is phenomenal it's phenomenal that we all get to witness it and it's yeah it's incredible I can't say enough good stuff about her other than she's the full package I think physically she's obviously incredible but I think her big attribute is her mental capacity to cope with stress, to want to compete again. We you know you talk about there's a small percentage of people who have a real bite and want to go after it hard. And you see it in them. Like you see it that they're the type of people when there's a bit of blood in the water, they're going to go. And like Rashid is one of them. And it's it's a joy. It's a joy to watch. And her career, as short as it's been, has been phenomenal. If you haven't got people excited for the Paris Olympics now, then I don't know. I don't know how you're going to do it because that was yeah. That's that's really got me excited for for Rashida across the next year, year and a half, two years. I mean, I remember the tweet. Uh, it was in the last six months. Michael Johnson put out the tweet, a video of one of her races over in over in America, and he said um, it's a bit of advice for her. Look out when she learns to use those arms. She's carrying them instead of using them to drive the legs. The difference is significant over 400. It helps increase speed and reduce fatigue. But as you say, she has time to. I guess improve on little, little small things like that, Derville, that, that can make a huge difference. 
Yeah, she has she has so much time. But it's interesting. I remember being in a studio, you know, with Sonia and we were talking about Jakob Ingebrigtsen, you know, the Norwegian mm. superstar. He's won like multiple Olympics, Worlds, Europeans, and he was really young at a European Championships a few years ago. And I remember Sonia saying something along the lines of, you know, if you're good enough, you're old enough. Like, and she's only 20, but she's good enough. So she's old enough for us to be talking about her in this context, but also in terms of scope for improvement. Yes, of course she has scope, but she, she's an incredible coach and coach Flo over there in Texas. And he'll be looking and there's a certain way people run naturally. And like Michael Johnson knows that better than anyone because his technique was so unique. And I think she runs a certain way and she has a certain flow and like, when her when you see her um how she covers the ground it's majestic it's it's incredible it's such a gift and it'll be interesting to see those little tweaks she makes because you don't want to go too far away from what makes you naturally good and like for me what makes her naturally good is how, how well she covers the ground with ease um and then the fact that she's got this unbelievable natural speed like mm. those to me those are her physical attributes that are so good so it will be interesting to see you know what the little tweaks she makes i think learning the event is massive like this is her first year really doing a full year of 400 we saw at europeans last year she was gutted not to medal at europeans and in many ways she had no right to think she was on the podium yet she did which goes back to her kind of mental fortitude and attitude um so yeah it's interesting like i love i love the, that the likes of michael johnson is talking about here because mm. I'm not sure we've ever really had that before, you know. We spoke to Eddie Dunbar as well. Like, how does Irish athletics market her in terms of um, this is a possibility? I mean, this is this is a superstar, pretty much. Do you know what? She's a global superstar, and I honestly believe that. Like, I think it's just a case of everyone goes along for the ride and enjoys enjoy being on it because Rashida will. I think try, I think she could potentially be the biggest sports star we've ever had, and she, that sort of you know those people that kind of transcend here, like you know, like with the utmost respect, like say when myself and you know the likes of David Gillick, Rob Heffernan, on our day if everything <coughs> went right, you know we could have a crack at it. Whereas I think Rashida will be at that level all the time. So how do you market it? I think from an athletic Ireland perspective, like it's about relationship management. It's about doing the things that help her and facilitate her. The fact that she's not based in Ireland, I honestly believe is a really good thing for her. Ireland's amazing. We all love being here, but it comes with a lot of pressure. We're a very small nation and she has the capacity to be so great that that's a lot of pressure to carry. And I think when you're actually physically removed from it, it makes it, it does make it easier. Um, so I think, yeah, for, from all of her perspectives, it's about being guided by what she'll do because I think she actually enjoys the pressure. I think she enjoys knowing people are talking about her. Um, she doesn't shy away from it. So, but you have to still remember, this is a, this is a 20 year old, you know, think about all of us at 20. Mm -hmm. Like it's very young. Yeah, Jesus, it, it's mad when you put it like that. Like, and it makes sense. Like, if she was an American athlete in Austin, doing what she's doing, the hype train would just be on another planet. It would just be incredible about her. Um, but as you say, you mentioned me her mental fortitude there a minute ago, Derva. Like, and, and I remember her being asked recently about how she gets over a bad performance, and she says she just tries to have short term memory. Um, mm. Remember that one race doesn't define her. Get over it. Use it as motivation as well to, to bounce back. For a twenty year old, just to even come out with things like that is is just remarkable it's it as you said mental fortitude is on a, another level it is it is remarkable but she's always been really remarkable like she's always had that bit of wisdom around performance and like it's probably the biggest skill that you can teach and you know even kind of going back to, to kids in sport that you can teach them that at the end of the day it's only a game it's only running it's only like even what Rashida does yeah it's really important to us and we all love it and we're here we're here for the journey but she's running around a lap like there's a lot bigger and worse things that go on in life so I think if you can keep that perspective it's a phenomenal tool because that is the thing as the stakes go higher that will destroy you you know it's the thing as an athlete where you lose that perspective that it's just running and it's just a game and it's not it isn't life Mm. yes it's very important but it's important in a moment and the fact that she has that already you know at her age and also you know something that I think is really really benefiting her 
that she's not totally dominating. So she's over there in the US. She's in their collegiate system. There's a girl, Britton Wilson. She's run 49 low, which is a couple of meters quicker than what Rashida's run now. So the fact that Rashida is not necessarily the top top right now in within that system that's really good for her because that'll keep her hungry and give her that fight and also she's got a girl in her training group julian alfred who's incredible over 100 200 so you have to think every time she goes training she's got a girl that's better than her on speed and then when she's coming out racing there's a girl who's dropped faster times than her so there's an element of that that will be a niggle for her and that's a good thing like you want her to have that the whole way hopefully up to Budapest and World Championships 100% gives her that extra motivation consistently uh, Derville you've really got us excited about the career of Rashida Adelecki as if we weren't already excited enough but um, really delighted you could join us this morning thanks a million enjoyed the chat guys thanks for having me great stuff Derville right there didn't get a chance Arch, to uh, Freudian slip I'm pretty sure her son Archie is named after Archie O'Leary who would be her husband's grandfather who owned Florida Pearl all oh, right famous, famous yeah, friend yeah. of white colours that still exists so I, I meant to get, we ran out of time but um, yeah so the, 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 I do find with that family because of her husband and his background Peter's like, two time Olympian Peter two time, so like um, spoken to him before big into his racing but like that's our background and it's almost like there's a pressure on the kids by by default because mm. of what their kid, their dads but like if you do the more you read about Evan Ferguson um, it's it's his parents like as much as he, he had ability the parents the role that they had and just yeah. stood away from it you don't hear them you never hear Barry's his dad talk so so important yeah a circular a circular finish to the show I think John Duggan started laughing when you talked about Evan Ferguson at the weekend that he was oh, on sure Saturday he, show I'm sure he did Evan, oh, yeah. um, but like Erling Haaland is is obviously a good example as well because his dad was a professional footballer so there's something in that but he was obviously brought up to be a humble guy as well yeah for sure um, and, and to want to succeed but it's challenging when you have that like it's almost preordained that you're going to become an athlete because your parents were or whatever exactly could have been a bit of an athlete yourself you're, uh, you're a good not, runner Jesus not 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 quite it used to be it used to be Johnny back in the day you're very Johnny, down and just after you lost the I know maybe that's it you're emotional I need to uh, get, get some mental fortitude out of Rashid Adelecki's uh, playbook Johnny great stuff as always thanks Shane Thanks many for coming in this morning on this Tuesday morning's uh, OTPM. On tomorrow's show, Jer is back with myself and it is a show with a difference. Owen Colgan, a.k.a. Balls from Hardy Bucks, will bring you his. You had to be there. I'm looking forward to that. He's coming to the studio as well. Uh, Tommy oh, Rooney's... On this. That, that's going to be fun, I know. <laughs> uh, Tommy Rooney will bring us his latest power rankings, no doubt some arguments there uh, and plenty of comments. Plus, uh, our succession debrief. There will be spoilers with special guest Sue Murphy. So don't say you weren't warned. I won't be getting involved in that conversation because I have six episodes left. So I'll be uh, putting the ear phones in uh, plus plenty more besides right now though Pat Nevin was with Joe on last night's show have a terrific Tuesday Welcome along so the final day of the Premier League season has come and gone Leeds down Leicester down Everton survive um, although there weren't scenes of jubilation I think it's fair to say because in part a few people came onto the pitch and the rest of the crowd stayed in their seats gave half-hearted boos uh, towards those fans who had gone onto the pitch and mainly just chanted sack the board so not exactly a feel-good story at Everton either but it could be a whole lot worse very happy to say Pat Nevin is with us good evening good evening um, yeah weird weekend it sure <laughs> was it's slightly reeling from it all but you know the Everton fans they've actually they're not stupid are they you know they know that they got away with it one goal in the last minute to equalise they go down and yeah. that's the nightmare scenario they were in that's how close they were and how close they've been far too often now and uh, that's not a fluke there's reasons for that and yeah. they know they've run out of lives haven't they <laughs> this is it that's the last one that's the last one well I think um, what was ringing in their ears from last year when again they were often chanting sack the board was uh, Frank Lampard and various others saying that's a line in the sand now this has to stop never again yeah, it's like King can you, you know, <laughs> the, the line in the sand's like halfway across the channel. Um, no, it's, it's, I mean, I'm smiling. I, I have to, can I tell you a funny story where I was, right? So I'm supposed to be covering the game. Uh, I was doing BBC, I was supposed to be at the game, but they, they told me too late. 
and I've got a new book coming out in a couple of days and I'd already arranged to do a big meeting and it must be the only book reading in history where I've got a book in one hand and I've got a phone in the other hand with the Everton game on and I'm trying to look at both of them at the same time and like so don't hide this just tell everybody that's watching so whatever you were whether you were in the ground whether you, like me you watched the, the highlights later uh, and then and watched it as much as you could on the kind of phone uh, it was just horrifyingly tense and you just knew that it, you're right it shouldn't be a celebration the Everton fans know they've took the fallen too far behind they look worse than they did last year but they still managed to stay up um, and they need to decide in having a you know a, what, who they, they need to know who they are now I don't think they do know who they are now they don't know, they don't know what kind of team they are style wise they're just kind of meh if, as it were right so you need to have what is your ethos and there, there clearly isn't one or, or, or the problem might be there's too many certainly within the, the board and it's different thoughts and then a bunch of different managers and different types of players it's just uh, a bit messy yeah and Farad Mashiri has uh, stopped attending games I think board members for their own safety have almost uh, stopped attending games I'm not sure if they've gone back since it really blew up but we're talking about people like Graeme Sharp here who's a non-executive director and Bill Kenwright's uh, chairman since 2016 Mashiri has spent um, close to a billion and we're talking 500 million on transfers alone and we're talking big name managers Koeman Marcus Silva Ancelotti Benitez uh, Sam Allardyce was in there I mean I'd forgotten about Big Sam till I was uh, reminded of that when I was just uh, reading about the last number of years at Goodison why I mean you, you talk to people involved and have a sense of what's going on why is it such a mishmash behind the scenes I mean who's in control of this club really it may well be that your final question is actually the answer <laughs> it's, it's the control of the club and control like Machiri has control of the club to a large extent but Bill Kenner has Kenner has some effect but control of direction I, I don't know honestly I don't think anybody really knows or if they have got a direction it's a very good one it's just not a good enough one um, so it's easy to say get a director of football in well he better have a good direction and you better trust trust him with it and he better be what you know working that way you know to up to his right or up to his left not both at the same time any club that has got misunderstanding uh double or treble visions at the top doesn't have a chance they don't have a chance it, it just doubles your costs all the time because you don't buy things or require things that are the same thing now that may be players that may be managers that might be the direction you're going um, and it's, I mean I can't imagine it I always think back to my time doing that sort of job at a small level etc etc mm. but I'm thinking back to that time and thinking can I imagine having somebody beside me who was kind of had the same sort of power but had completely different ideas. Honestly, like I'm, I'm breaking cold sweats at the idea of it. And apart from the stress and the pressure of it, so and especially if then you're not working together, you're working against each other, which is going to cause tensions because we're all human beings. And the fans know that; they can see that it's not working right, it's not working comfortably, and there's been bad decision making. Um, and yeah, hey, not every decision's been bad. There's been some decent players have got in over the time, but they haven't been the right players at the right time in the right places. And again, this all seems dead easy but you need to know the business you need to know the game um, and I'm just getting a feeling it's, it's not joined up thinking and it makes it, the other clubs that do it and do it well they make it look dead easy and from the outside it does look dead easy it's actually really complicated yeah. there's a lot to put in place and you have to get everybody on the same page and even if somebody's really good but they're not on the page they've got to go vicious though it might seem they got to get out of the picture so I, I, honestly it's, it frightens me and I'm, you don't see me this animated like, I get really annoyed by everyone now because it's going to happen I'm amazed it didn't happen this year I'll be honest with you uh, after the Fulham game I thought it was going to happen then you know Dice actually gets a little bit of a tune out of them um, for a couple of games and that was kind of all that was needed but it, it just looks as if it could happen again and if the FFP is what they say it is and if there are further drawbacks in costs and spending because of the new stadium uh, it's unthinkable it's ice well no it's not unthinkable nobody's got the right to stay up mm. but if they go down their particular position with the debt and with the new stadium is scary 
Yeah. You sort of feel like Deitch is the type of manager that will run the legs off them in pre-season. Mm -hmm. They'll be pretty honest and they'll finish 15th next year. It just has that vibe about it, best case scenario. Uh... I'm looking at all the players and they've got it in them to do it because they've done it two or three times this season. They certainly done it in the game yesterday. Um, they did it, well, they say they did it at Brighton. They had 22% possession. But they've shown it on sporadic occasions. And people think, yeah, it's in there. You've got it. You can do that sort of thing. Teams and players that do it sporadically tell me they can't do it all the time or they won't do it all the time. And it's really unusual for those lepers to change their spots mm. as a group, as a unit. So what any manager, be, Daesh seems perfect in, to some degree for me. Uh, just if you possibly can, do the old-fashioned wheeling and yeah. dealing. But that's a kind of... Um it's such a limited uh, in, uh, scope in terms of its ambition. I mean, it's like this club has been badly run. There's no sign of real improvement. Deitch is like a strong manager who can cobble together limited players and, and, and you know, the mistakes in the transfer market into something vaguely coherent, uh, hence the 15th. And and that's kind of, you know, that's a really, it's a grim thing as well. Um, is well, it's said forever in the history. Yeah. In the, the fans of what they expect. And also, so the kind of old fashioned if you played forever and you know about the school of science the fact that you'd expect it to go and entertain as well yes they'll get behind you in tough times but hey they're coming in they're paying the money and it's it's a part of the world that isn't always the most you know it's, it's, everyone's not minted up there you know and it's, it's tough sometimes to explain and of course the vast majority of people that are in that ground are local-ish or born from local people you know across the Stanley Park yeah there's plenty of them there but there's lots of people that come from around the world I mean yes Ireland lots and lots from there but there's plenty coming from Germany there's plenty coming from Australia there's plenty coming from America you're not getting those sort of levels at Everton so you you can't go and make it a kind of tourist club as well as a you know, local club so they've got all these things against them so are you aiming for top four well you've got to aim but realistically it's miles away mm. it's, it's, and it's not miles away it's light years away and I can't see any way that can happen because you then you almost need to say ever you need to be the next you know South, Southampton but the, you know before they fell apart Brighton before you know they were there just now Brentford you need to be that that's been done mm. really well <laughs> it took years to do that really well so it's, I'm sure honestly I'm, it's worrying and it's frightening but is there a long term plan and someone brilliant the, the last person with a long term plan there was a good one I, I'll give Ancelotti a pass because I thought he was doing a good job and he knew what he was doing he's a great manager uh, but it really may be Moisey you know right. it may be Moisey was a real long term plan Um and that was a wee bit 15th, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that wasn't yesterday. No. Leicester, meanwhile, they're down. They are just the most fascinating case study. I mean, there's so much to talk about here, which is interesting. Uh, highest wage bill in Premier League history to go down. And look, of course, I think that's a likely um, stat given the money in football now and inflation in football. But it's worth noting that their wage bill is 180 million sterling. So it is the highest outside the top six. So if the wage bill is as integral and uh, significant as we're told it is then the seventh highest wage bill has just been relegated they have made a mess on so many fronts here for instance I mean, you, you talk about well run clubs and, and where Everton are on that spectrum nine uh, first team players out of contract this summer as a weird scenario to sleepwalk into and I don't think you sleepwalk into that's just bad organisation isn't it or, like, it's shocking or you want it with some of them you know, with some of them, you actually want them to be out. Mm, okay. So you think, okay, they're coming at the end of their time. We can't hoof them out because they've been servants to the club and all that. But if there's any of them that have any value, then you've made a mess of it. Yeah, Tielemans. <laughs> Tielemans is going to walk off for free. And, and that's been coming for about two years, is an interesting... So that, uh, that's, that's a huge error, right? I don't, don't disagree for a second. But the, within these nine, there'll be some that's a good idea, some fine, I get that, mm. some... Would we have fought for it if we went down because we can't really afford them anyway? Um, but you're right, it's, it's not it's too many. Yeah. And also, if you think about, you know, how long is it since they won the league? 16. And, yeah. 
And, you know, Vardy was the main man, the main scorer. And who are they looking to still to some degree? You know, Ian Ashley's come in, but he's still turning to Vardy. And it's football's not like that. There's not that many on the planet that can actually keep at that level for that length of time. And particularly with the quickies, <coughs> when they fall, they fall off the end of a cliff. Because it's, it's not that he's not got pace, but he can't keep it up to that level. And the reason why Vardy was probably a, a very good goal scorer, hungry, all that sort of stuff. But see that fantastic run, run he made? He made a hundred of them in a game and only one of them come off. Mm. But he could make a hundred. And he can't do that anymore. And it's, it's not an abuse of Jamie. He's, he's a fabulous amount of work he's put on. So you found yourself taking the goals that he would have had away so that's just him that's just one so there's all the other things about every time you actually bought got what looked like great players or who were great for Leicester they didn't always go in to be great <laughs> you just sold them and then you're leaving holes eventually those da- gaps don't get filled by the right people and you know that's clearly what happened what was it? they did score enough goals didn't they there was enough goals scored but it was the defence was just a, a mess for the amount of goals lost and I didn't think they had much of a direction and Brendan I think Brendan had told them last season I think he'd said to them it's, you, you, this is time it's overdue time you need to make this massive change and I think they may have thought oh, we can get away with it for another year yeah and they were probably within their rights to think they could get away with it for another year really like, well, don't it, get a manager to tell you what to do then don't tell don't do it he asks you well I hear you because I mean Rodgers is, is interesting in that when he departed last year and Leicester had finished in the top 10 five years in a row they'd had two fifth place finishes remember they just missed out in Champions League and then last year they had finished eighth and I think in terms of goals scored they were fifth in the table so if they tightened up according to Rodgers goals conceded at set piece they could really do something at the top of the table he had also around that time been critical of the attitude in a sense of of players and it seems um, when he returned after the summer the players he had wanted weren't bought and equally players he had wanted to offload had not been offloaded and he came back post summer talking about a different set of expectations and he seems to have just hung around because they were paying him eight or nine million a year and who's going to walk away from that but for a good month he just looked like a guy who was begging to be fired I mean I can't say fire me but if you're just I mean in any way adept at reading my body language what I'm saying in these interviews just fire me and they took far too long to do that and that, that's another issue but like what a, a weird season they win one in ten so this terrible summer they win one in ten at the start of season and then because they have this quality that's still there they go and win four in a row that gets you 12 points uh, so they're 12th going into the World Cup so you think in four games you get 12 points the other 34 games you just need 24 points and they have a, a, a spell where they win one in 15 like there's whatever you, you can definitely blame ownership for sure uh, there's something in that dressing room though which was off attitude wise the, the, the runs as well the, the, the runs that you go on are they're horrible I mean I, I do have to think back to the, my, I had one relegation in my career and the team was good enough to stay up I knew that it was easy it was obvious we were well good enough to we were we found, talking about the status stuff right you can make them say anything you like we were fifth top scorers in the league and we went down right <laughs> so how did you work that one out well it's kind of not difficult goalkeeper might help um, and one or two other things like that but in the end it's for me as a player I, mean, I remember like right okay a, a lot's been asking me now so I, I look at Madison or Barnes or whatever right okay it's my turn to do it I'll do something special I'll work really hard I'll create stuff I'll make sure it goes right and it is the classic case in those situations after two or three losses you look up and you can see nothing you can see people running away you never see eyes you're going you really honestly don't want it <laughs> you really are that scared mm. you really are that lacking in confidence and they would they'll all say they're not but nobody wants to be the person or appears to be the person I say nobody but not enough people feel as if they can be the person until the last moment when everyone's on it and then they'll all fight and battle and chase and all that and scratch you they'll do all that but it's amazing while they're on those runs 
it's as if players think well we probably won't go down and mm. I don't want to be the one the fans turn on because they're already understandably limited confidence just then plummets to nothing and then they get dropped they're out of the team they might lose the job that's the thinking right? and when you're going through those phases I, I, I watch games like I mean, we all watch games and we watch the ball but and we watch a bit of the rest of it I do spend a lot of time watching the rest of it you know the the shape yes but also the body language and why didn't you make that run there if you make that run there you're going to get the ball and you know it but you didn't go and I'm thinking yeah I know why because you don't fancy it and that's what happens that is exactly what happens and it's horrifying because on the pitch you think you want to call people cowards because they won't take the ball um, it's a horrible 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 thing and but I think it's human nature Yeah. and you just saw that happening they didn't there was a period there where they didn't look, look like they could lose but there was also a period where nothing would make them win a game of football you know and then just add bad luck on top of that, that that's, that's so it. Was a, there was a moment mainly watching the Everton game but where they showed the Harvey Barnes goal from uh, the King Power and I mean everything about it is quality <laughs> like, we're just watching a relegated side here score a goal like that it's not really meant to be that way the point can you I, would can I say one other thing to you just before you go yeah, on yeah. that right? and I do think it's important and everyone will say it now, Everton fans are angry you know just now but with all three teams that are, went down are quite angry but everybody just about above them is thinking yeah yeah we're, we're okay we're good we're a bit quality it, there is nothing between all those teams even Southampton who managed to beat Manchester City they they actually aren't rubbish it was just things like lack of confidence and just being a little bit less good the, the quality you can go down with now is actually really good and I've felt that for a long time but it's quite clear with Leicester they, in years gone by that team would have been fine absolutely confident that team would have been fine there would always been three or four really pretty teams that you thought we kind of shouldn't be there um, there were no teams I don't think Southampton maybe at a push some games but everybody else they were capable of being good enough to stay up um, so there's no rubbish teams so you need to be a, a pretty decent team but also you need to perform all the time um, and that's the end they didn't perform enough yeah Needless to say, Premier League champions in 16, FA Cup winners two years ago, it's an unbelievable fall from grace. Where you would have some uh, sympathy, for, uh, certainly on the, on the first point I was going to make, is that you do have to remind yourself that their owner, who was just so invested in the club, and it was clearly probably the most enjoyable aspect of his working life, dies in the most freakishly uh, tragic circumstances in 2018. And the other thing, and I, I probably hadn't appreciated this as much until I was reading various pieces this morning, uh, it does seem COVID really did hit them hard because the King Power duty-free business was brought to a standstill. And so this was a family and a, and a, and a company thinking about, you know, unbelievable crises. And so purse strings were tightened, including very much at Leicester. So lack of investment, you couldn't really foresee COVID for obvious reasons. That has not helped their cause. The um, scary thing for Leicester going forward is that the BBC have reported, so their income is going to fall from 214 a million this year to 70 million in the championship but because this was not a club who were planning for relegation whatsoever they have a loan with the big Australian bank and uh, that loan is to do with player amortization and uh, broadcasting revenue but basically as you would expect all of the repayments are set against TV money, which is now not coming. Uh, so it seems that the club will actually have no benefit from the parachute payments. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now.